な白い者たち」「正々堂々正々堂々」正正堂々「そんなハイテンションでぶつかれ」「熱いアドレナリンがスパイスする」「正々堂々」
I don't think my funny was very successful. No, it wasn't. Oh, say that again. Sorry, I didn't put no, you on No, it time. wasn't. <laughs> I didn't put you on in time. Hi. Hi. It is I. Just kidding. I loved it. I was just <laughs> bullying. <laughs> it is I, hey. Supersonic1014, and my co-writer slash boyfriend, Lucy Lucid. Yeah, I'm in agony right now. I need I need a root canal, so my mouth is horrible. Ah <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. And Sunny said, "Yay!" Cool. <laughs> Just kidding. I Just like kidding. pain. <laughs> Just kidding, Sunny. I'm teasing. I'm never gonna get this volume quite how I want it, so that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, that's too many people. Just kidding. <laughs> No, they aren't talking. The music is. Around here, we let the music do the talking for the first 15 minutes, and then I come in and fuck it all up. <laughs> I, 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 I'm trying not to freak out about it. Oh, my favorite Steven Universe episode? Shit. Well, you heard it here first. Um, what was it, John? I know I, I, know I had one, but I forgot was what it was. Was it a Rose episode? I think so. Rose is my favorite character, so that would make sense. Rose's scabbard? Mm. No. No. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> ah, well. Anyway, um, yeah, we are starting in about 12 minutes. Uh, some of you might be wondering when you saw the trailer if you saw the trailer. Oh, hey. Thanks, Sonny, for the oh. money that says trans rights. Trans you rights money. Took some uh, dollars and just took a permanent marker and wrote trans rights on it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, you may have noticed when you looked at the trailer that I'm also going all the way back to Super Watermelon Island. Oh, thank you, Knight. I appreciate the $2. And yeah, this is crazy. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be the first to say that some of the stuff that I say in Super Watermelon Island to, I think it was Barnmates, yeah, is stupid. It's some of my older stuff, and so it's not as good. So, yeah, your older stuff sucks. So, Just kidding. <laughs> cringe warning, the first four episodes are probably gonna be ass. Yeah. Well, especially, it doesn't get it good until I start co-writing. <laughs> yeah, because I apparently said some stupid shit that you didn't agree with in the newer ones as well. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, if you're so good at it, why not write it yourself? And so here you are. Yeah. I'm replacing John slowly ever slowly. <laughs> does this go back to pre-hiatus? Yes, it does. Um, I think the furthest it goes back is... Shit, probably September of 2019. Ew. Let me look actually before I get Ew. before I spread misinformation on the internet. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think John is either. Yeah. A lot of the good sins are his. <laughs> well, that's because I think you're probably a little bit burnt out to this point. And that's I mean, what how this many... will fix. Yeah, September 2019. I nailed it. How many episodes have you done so far in total? And I I've can never check. It might I've not never, be fully accurate. I've never watched Cats, so I don't know how it is. A hundred and three episodes. That doesn't include the any extra shit, though. That doesn't yeah. include April Fools. That doesn't include shorts. It doesn't include Save the Light or Attack the Light. Yeah, I think you're probably at this point burnt out, so that's why. You kind of need an extra person giving you help. Yeah. Oh. Oh, the animal, not not the movie cats. Um, John is a Thank cat person. Mountain. I'm a dog person. So. Yeah. Love cats. Love them. I love cats too. I just like dogs more. So yeah. Someone said <laughs> hi, Supersonic Ten Fourteen. I like your videos. Thank you, Malik. I appreciate it. 
But yeah, 2019 me was definitely. Uh, what the fuck, mate? Was definitely let's let's say less smart than 2023 me. So get ready to cringe. Just kidding. Yeah. I don't know. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. Get ready to cringe. Some of the stuff I scrubbed through them. Some of the stuff is not founded in logic. <laughs> I haven't watched your old, like, videos at all recently, so it will be a surprise for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. Cringing <laughs> meter easing. I, yeah. I'm the one who- I super glued Ruby <laughs> to the bubble. I thought it'd be funny. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Slade. Also, you didn't show me the screen, John. Why didn't you show me the screen? Oh, because I didn't think you'd be interested in it. Bruh. <laughs> How do you, what do you think? Pretty good shit. Nice. Also, um, I have... in... Yeah. Will we have commentary after every video? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm gonna be turning the mic off and sitting it out until we're done. I mean, I wouldn't mind it. I know, but that's how I've done it. And I know, I like but at the same it. time, I feel like that like, might add a little bit more to it, to the fact of, like, why not just watch them yourself instead of just watching that's in this fair. marathon? A consideration I for next marathon. Plus, I'll be mm -hmm. in chat. So, that helps a little bit. Does this mm -hmm. include the April Fool's one? You'll see. <laughs> Will Glow come in and blow everything up? Ah, uh, no, not this one. Darn it. Glow's sitting on the bench for this one. How is he? How does he sit? He floats and acts like he's sitting. Can he grow legs? <laughs> no. Oh, I don't like that response. <laughs> Why are we getting rid of Glow? Because here's a here's a fun fact for you. Um, because we don't really have time to go into it. I don't really like my older Globe episodes anymore. I really shoehorned them in and did not know how to write even a lick. So there's my I... official statement on a stream with 80 people. I don't like Glo I like Globe as a character. I don't like Globe as a series anymore. Like, it took me a little bit way. It took me way too long to even understand what was going on in Globe. Yeah. Like, I've watched it several times and been like, what the fuck is going on? So unfortunately, the globe story is going to be shelved. You're not missing much anyway. Trust me. <laughs> and then there's the, and then and there's the thing I talked with John's ear about the fucking court scene. Stupid. Anyway, uh, take a look at this. You're changing the subject quickly. Yeah, it's off in the corner, but I I won't notice if you don't. I won't tell why anyone is, if you don't. Why is disclaimer not be. centered? Because I need to perform the magic, the magic button combo. Okay. By the way, are you gonna? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> are you gonna stream it to me, by the way, so then I can see it when it actually happens instead of in the stream? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. Unless it's gonna make it lag at all, which I. Don't it should do. not. It should not. This computer is a beast. Will this even work? Okay, it will. Awesome. Swag. Kill. Oh, we're back to here. <laughs> Swag. Keep Kill. it off center. <laughs> not the old disclaimer. Yep. Record chat. I'm not doing that. What do you think Where'd I you am? Where did you pull that face? Did someone draw that for you? or? Uh, I pulled it off the internet. <laughs> really? Yeah. Probably was, some it's... of deviant art person. Yeah, because it's not. It's not. It's That's not. stealing, John. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well. Doesn't chat get recorded on its own? Like, doesn't it save yeah, it? Yeah, I have chat replay turned on so that when the VOD's here, I can look back at the chat. And hopefully you can look back at the chat because I'm hopefully going to um, be able to keep this one public. Yeah, or unlisted. Please. The other marathon is also unlisted, so I might make that one public, too. We'll see. Alright, three more minutes. 
he are, he has goes. already done the movie, and we are planning on doing future when that time comes. When the time comes. I can't wait for that shit. Yeah, because no one knows I hate it. That, that, that feels like it's going to be a lot of fun, so... Yeah, because I'm going to be yelling at it. He's going to have his grievances. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. What's your least favorite feature episode? The one that's the proposal one. My least favorite one is the um, Steven Tag one. Like, I know a lot of people probably love that episode, but it felt really dull for me. Yeah. It felt like a whole lot of nothing happening, so I just didn't really care. Yeah, that one. That one's awful. Oh, and, uh, like, this isn't related to future, but I've got two episodes, maybe three episodes in mind, that are probably going to get the same treatment as the new Lars. Those so episodes said... being the one that has Ruby Rider in it, and the, the one I just told you. Someone said, how are you, how are you, John? I'm all right. What do you think about season five? It is my second least favorite season. Not a big fan of season five. I, I think it's really funny that when we talk about fucking future, I feel like what we dislike about future is like completely like we have our own completely different reasons of liking it. I mean, disliking it. So pretty much if we make an everything wrong with future, it's jam packed with your things and my things. Because yeah. we have different things we dislike about it. Mm -hmm. What's the worst season? Season 1A. That's pretty cool. John of Own It. Want It. I don't know how you pronounce it. It's an earth kind of thing. Oh, not too many Johns. All right. One minute left. So we will be playing the episodes all the way through. Me and Noah will not hop back in until it is done. We will Move. be leading up to the premiere of Bubble, which is in about two and a half hours to two hours and 45 minutes so yeah that's about how long it'll be i'm gonna go ahead and mute us again uh have a good time chill out or don't have a good time <laughs> and we'll catch you guys in about three-ish hours oh god guys I'll see please you john's gonna kidnap me please 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 Disclaimer, I love Steven Universe. This series is done purely for fun and to point out some flaws in Steven Universe logic, not for any malicious or defaming intentions. Thank you. Rocks in the stream? No rocks in the stream. I do have to admire what the Crooniverse did with the Watermelon Stevens here. Most shows would have just treated them like they never even existed at all, but the fact that the Crooniverse made them somewhat relevant by having them make their own little colony is a pretty neat little storyline, I must admit. Not to mention, it's also really clever how they incorporated growing watermelon children and making a sort of adoption system out of it. That got a chuckle out of me. Steven. Okay, there are several things about this situation that just stick out as odd, especially considering that this isn't just a dream. A, why did Malachite decide to make her home near Mask Island of all things? I get that it's some form of land to hang around, but considering that Malachite is mostly controlled by Jasper at this point, wouldn't she want to, you know, not move too far away from where the gems are? B, doesn't Jasper call Steven Rose Quartz rather than just Steven? If so, then why exactly does she call him Steven here? 
She realistically shouldn't know that the watermelons are called Watermelon Stevens, and if anything, she shouldn't even know what a watermelon is. And even if that were the case, then again, she never sees Steven as Steven. She sees him as Rose Quartz. So wouldn't she technically see Steven's shape and assume it to be shaped like Rose Quartz instead? Jesus, even my explanation still isn't helping how confusing this is. See, what interest would Malachi take to this watermelon sacrificing ritual? Considering she's a homeworld gem, I'm assuming she doesn't need to eat or anything like that. And surely she knows that her doing this is just wasting time and risking drawing some suspicion. If anything, this just feels like more plot contrivance just for the sake of the Malachite battle later. Because why else would she do this instead of just going to look for Rose Quartz? Considering she's found some way to move around. Didn't you feel that? Feel what? I feel like the Crystal Gems should be questioning that more considering how often they are. You know? The Crystal Gems, the protectors of the planet. Also, in this shot, the chalkboard is on the Bye Bye Earth side, but in the next shot, it suddenly shifts to the other side. This error in particular is kind of worse than others because our attention is shifted mostly to the chalkboard in these next shots, so people are more likely to notice this one. After this shot, Amethyst's sandwich just flat out disappears. What, was the Shadow Realm hungry? But they told me it was too dangerous. Why don't you just disobey them? You rebel. Isn't that like your guys' thing? Peridot would be good at everything wrong with. I'll fall asleep and go into a watermelon Steven again. This way, I can help them and be safe at the same time. Yeah, and put another person's life in danger. I guess endangering others for the sake of your own cause is Steven's entire shtick these days, huh? <coughs> Movie. <coughs> Okay, that's kind of fucked up, and anti steven as well. Taking away someone's free will for your own usage. Not to mention Steven possessing a watermelon earlier ended up kind of killing it. I was kidding earlier, Kruniverse. One of Pearl's fingers disappears in this frame. As the gems are fusing, Steven is standing on the sand, but in the very next shot, that sand spontaneously grew some grass over top of it. We don't have to fight! You say as you're ready to fight? But you're out of your death! That was horrible, even for this show's pun standards. Alexandrite's mouth is the wrong color in this shot. Okay, how the fuck did that work? It's fire against water. Ten water droplets. Nine water droplets. Yes, I'm that petty. Welcome to everything wrong with. Oh, and you thought I was done being petty? Nine arrows in this shot, yet only seven end up hitting Malachite's shield. They had plenty of time to get out of the way of that. Incredible how this show seems to just super glue people to the ground instead of making interesting fighting choreography. Alexandrite's mouth is still the wrong color. Still the wrong color. You know, now would be a good time for the fire. No? Just gonna take it like a dunce? Jesus Christ. Four Watermelon Stevens land on Malachite's eyes in this shot. In the next shot, the one above this Watermelon Steven disappears. Boy, the Shadow Realm must be fucking starving. God fucking damn it. This one's definitely more of a nitpick, but you probably could have pulled out some gauntlets to make that pack more of a punch. You two should spend some time apart. Fly out of the way, you idiot! I can't even use the glue to the ground joke because she can literally fly anywhere! There is no excuse! This, combined with the animation errors, really goes to show that the Kruniverse are terrible at fight scenes. Like, if this hadn't happened, the Crystal Gems would have straight up lost fair and square, but because of plot convenience or whatever the fuck, this bullshit happens. For fuck's sake. Also, Malachite is visible in the sky in this shot, but when Alexandrite fires the arrow, she's suddenly gone from this exact spot. So, I mean, they moved her. Oh, fuck it, it's just an error. This one is just plain unexcusable. Lapis and Jasper are right next to the Crystal Gems in these shots. Where are they in this shot? Are you fucking serious? The Earth needs you, Steven. We'll be fine. You can do this. We believe in you.
I feel like this moment is genuinely underrated because I really don't see people talking about it a lot. It really goes to show how far we've come from season one, and I just love this scene. You know the drill. <sighs> So after I finish writing my scripts, I like to visit the episode Steven Universe wiki page in order to pick up on errors I may have missed. For Gem Drill, however, this is listed. Now I can't 100% confirm that this is true or not, as my Google searches have turned up nothing and I don't recall seeing this error when I first watched on TV. Thus, I'm not going to add a sin for it, but I wanted to let you guys know in case it is true. Anyway. I can highlight multiple instances of the storyboarding for this episode being rather subpar in comparison to other episodes. I normally don't notice it as much, so it must be especially egregious here. I get there are different storyboarders for different episodes to make production faster, but that doesn't help that some of these shots just look plain ugly to me. Say, we'll do it together and it's gonna be great! We're gonna do it together and it's gonna be great! Liar! It's actually two more hours to the cluster. The Earth will probably be destroyed by then. Seriously, you didn't think to spring for some kind of faster turbo mode or something? If that would possibly injure Steven, simply don't bring him along. I can't even uh, stretch out. It's a drill. Did you expect some kind of luxury suite? How'd you think you were going to get everyone in here anyway? We didn't have a lot of time to plan. Perhaps if the Crystal Gems didn't spend all that time doing nothing, maybe you could have planned all this out better. Gee, it's almost as if Peridot was right. It's hard not to have some feelings for where you came from. Especially since you changed allegiances literally three episodes ago. This is so fucking rushed. Something doesn't feel right about this. Then use the D-pad. Steven, I'm sorry I couldn't save you or the billions of other life forms who matter far, far less to me. Do you have any last words? You could be drilling right now instead of just giving up. The pod suddenly grows in size in this shot just for the sake of this angle. You'd think if this was a matter of life or death, she wouldn't just be sitting there. Also, I never brought this up before because I never really thought about it until now, but what good did Peridot think a drill would do? Think about it, there's billions of different gem shards in the Earth at this point, right? With a density that big, surely Peridot would realize that a measly Earth drill wouldn't be enough to break through that many shards at once. Especially if the shards can survive something like magma. And even if the drill was really the only option the gems had at that point in time, you'd think Peridot would try to account for the weakness of the drill's, well, drilling capabilities by upgrading its parts a little. Seriously, how did Peridot think this would work? Activating triple tip penetration mode! Oh fucking god! What exactly is stopping them from forming? Even when Steven convinces them and makes them want to stay, they then say they, quote, can't stop and are going to form. Yet here they are, still not formed, even when they wanted to form. Ugh, this reeks of plot contrivance. <gasps> They're bubbling each other! How the fuck? They've probably never even heard of the concept of bubbling for at least thousands of years, let alone them being fucking shards. Yet suddenly they could just bubble each other on a whim? Steven bubbled five out of billions. This is the conclusion this arc has been building up to for half a fucking season? This is literally fan fiction levels of writing, come on! Ugh, 25 sins please. On earth, did you bubble that whole thing? Pearl would be so great at everything wrong with it's almost like the Crooniverse knew how stupid that resolution was. I didn't comment on this last time because, well, frankly, I always stop watching episodes right before the credits. 
But the song that plays during the credits here, despite the fact that it only lasts like 10 seconds, sounds really damn good. Take a listen. Suddenly, Wapamo, Kapowie! Also, this is yet another example of the storyboard quality being, let's just say, lacking. Paradox Jam disappears in this frame. Look, I know everyone's meme this shit to death, but it wouldn't be everything wrong with if I didn't point it out, so. Paradox's hair looks like she blew it up with fucking helium and that she'll float away at any second. I whip out the old photon blaster and pew pew, pa chow chow! Steven's body is facing the gems in this shot. In the next shot, however, he's suddenly facing the barn. Even better yet, I was originally going to use this shot to show this inconsistency, but this shot in particular also shows another inconsistency. Look at how close the gems are to the barn and the hole in this shot. Now look back at the last shot. The perspective is so warped and fucked up here that it looks like the gems are further away from the barn than they should be. You could always come back to the temple with us and live in the bathroom again. No thanks. I have seen what goes on in there. Leon! For every moment I find funny, there's always another moment that makes me absolutely cringe to no end. You could live in Surf City, or Sea City, Aquatown, Bayburg... Real creative names there, Crewniverse. Once again, I have to pay my respects to this show's incredible soundtrack. Take a listen. If you lived in these trees, you could build a giant bird's nest and have squirrels for pets. You could eat acorn pie every night, and when it gets hotter it rains, you'd be protected by these nice leaves. How do you expect Lapis to understand half of the Earth concepts you just fired at her all at once? You'd have a fun job at a local coffee shop and come home to a wacky roommate. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, so that's your limit? Either A, Lapis knows nothing about Earth but doesn't question Steven's whole country spiel from earlier. Or B, Lapis understands everything about Earth and is just lying to Steven here for shits and giggles. The episode itself suggests there's literally no in-between. You'd like it in Jersey. The people here seem to hate the Earth, too. Okay, as a New Jersey and myself, you're not wrong. This one star passes over Lapis rather than behind her. Oh, cool. The galaxy warp. How incredibly convenient that out of the thousands of miles of ocean out there, Steven and Lapis just happen to come across the one tiny spot that the galaxy warp is on. I was only meant to visit for a short time. What reason would a Lapis have needed to be sent to Earth for a short time? Better still, what reason would a Lapis have needed to be sent to Earth for a short time during a war? You guys remember this line from That Will Be All? And I get terrified, a Lapis terraformed. Terraforming is something typically done to support new life and living on a planet. I would also assume that this process takes quite a long time, so that immediately debunks the whole short time thing. Plus, it's clear that she wasn't sent here with the intent of fighting in the war, because the way she words her sentence here indicates that she didn't even know there was a war going on. And we know that she was sent here by somebody because of her saying that she was only meant to visit for a short time. With this knowledge, what good would a Lapis terraforming do in the middle of a war, much less one that they don't even know is happening? Without the answer to this question, I'm just left to assume that this is a case of plot contrivance once again. I see Lapis is copying off of Peridot's hairstyle. This is my new home away from home world. No, it's not. It's mine. Why does Lapis suddenly get so possessive here? It's kind of jarring considering her character. Also, why is Peridot smiling through all this?
Why does this line look really slanted in this shot, but then perfectly straight in the next? She's the one that needs to know. I want her to understand. Aw, Peridot. That's sweet. With the way Peridot's worded this, she's acting like Lapis needs to know, and will thus be forcing this idea on her when it's clear Lapis will act negatively to it. That's not sweet. That's barging in on someone when they clearly just need some time alone. Steven should recognize this, right? So then why is he acting so positively on this clearly intrusive plan? Hell, why is the episode treating this as the correct answer? This image is cursed and it needs to leave my sight immediately. If you write it from your heart, your feelings will reach her. Right, and you saw how that worked out before. Seriously, why does Steven think this will work? Hey, Lovely! Hey! <sighs> hey! Why isn't she responding? I'm not sure. Steven, you did hear Lapis earlier, right? You know, despite my whole Steven is a dumbass tirade from earlier videos, I'd like to think Steven actually cared enough to recognize how his own friends feel and not be this oblivious. Sorry I interrogated you. You were just full of such useful information. That's a sincere compliment. Peridot. It seems illogical to me that it would be any of the writing elements. It took me over an hour to compose it, and I was the most sincere as per Steven's instructions. It could be she's just not much of a reader. Steven is awful in this episode. It's like the Kroonover specifically wrote him to not be himself in order to service this shit show. Do you seriously think that, given Steven's character throughout this entire show, Steven wouldn't at least say something like, well, you didn't really compliment her, you did make it seem like only her information was valuable. Steven's supposed to be a good talker, right? Surely he'd recognize the Peridot did this. But no, let's just change this aspect of Steven for... what? More wacky antics with Peridot trying to apologize? Give me a fucking break. Also sins, give me a lot of those too. Watch in awe as the Kroonoverse wastes 15 seconds of everyone's time. Hmm. Ah. <gasps> no. No. Nuh-uh. But if... Yeah? Nah. Yeah, that'd probably be overdoing it. Uh. H2O, oh my gosh. This is the worst sentence the Kroonoverse has ever written into the script. That deserves multiple sins, Jesus Christ. You do realize that I spent the last few months trapped under the ocean, right? And you expect her to know this... how? I'm kind of taking a break from water right now, but thanks for the lake. Okay, now Lapis is crossing to just plain unreasonable. I get it. The gift was bad. Okay, fair enough. But surely by now Lapis has to realize the effort Steven and Peridot are putting forth at this point, right? Sealing off this hole, which probably took a little while, then filling it with water due to the both of them thinking she likes water. Not to mention, Steven is also very clearly a part of this effort, and since Steven's kind of her favorite person right now, you'd think this would help her attempt to see how much Peridot's trying. But nah, we gotta fill 11 minutes, so let's just make Lapis an unfeeling, heartless bitch, despite everything these two have done to at least try to make her feel better. Fuck change, am I right? Peridot is forever horrible, despite Steven liking her, and there's nothing she can do to tell her otherwise. It's unrealistic at best, fucking horrible writing at worst. More sins, please. Don't worry, Steven. It's not your fault. Oh, and this is just an extra kick in the nuts. Don't worry, Steven. This thoughtful gift that was an earnest attempt by someone who doesn't really understand me yet wasn't your fault. It's her fault for trying to be nice to me. And no, Steven completely shuts down the argument that Lapis thinks Peridot is just trying to be friends so she can use her again. If that were the case, Steven wouldn't be rigorously advocating for the two of them to be friends. Hell, Steven wouldn't even be talking highly of Peridot at all. It's just shitty writing. Fuck this episode. When I was stuck here, Steven gave me this tape recorder as a gift, and I didn't really get it at first, but it made me feel better just to talk about all the weird stuff that was happening. It'll help you, too. Press the button to record, and, and then you're talking to it. I don't want your garbage. What is this episode teaching children, exactly? 
Oh, you know that bad thing someone did in the past? Yeah, you're completely justified in putting that bad thing on a pedestal and hating them forever for it. Who cares about their emotions, their dreams, their aspirations, their story, any amount they might change or want to make amends to make things right? No matter what they do or how much they might regret their actions, you're free to continue acting like a spoiled brat and never move on. We call these people children because that's the petty shit children do. I think you could see how much I hate this episode. Wrapping paper on the ground? No wrapping paper on the ground. Steven's pupils don't go away when he blinks in this shot. It genuinely seems like the crewniverse stopped giving a shit in this scene, in both writing and animation. Why do you trust her, Steven? Because I know her. Lapis, you're not even giving her a chance. You should have at least gotten to know her before you decided you don't like her. And no, this doesn't fix it. Steven could have easily said this earlier, but he instead acts ignorantly and waits until Peridot's feelings are effectively crushed into tiny pieces before he finally decides to tell Lapis off. This message isn't doomed from the start, but what makes it all fall apart is how much Steven's character is butchered in an attempt to tell it. And even then, it still doesn't address the main issue because of the way Steven worded it. Oh, you should at least get to know her better before you arbitrarily decide that the past things she's done still leads you to hating her anyway. God, this episode sucks. More sins, please. This doesn't even feel like genuine character growth due to how bored Lapis looks through all this. It seriously feels like she's only doing this because she feels she has to, not because she wants to make up for how horrible she was. Peridot. Are you okay? What a train wreck. I don't want your garbage. What is Lapis even looking at here? Eyeball looks directly at the group here, but somehow doesn't see them. I guess she only has one eye, but I assume that eye at least works, surely. Also, Eyeball was using her left hand to leave the ship in this shot, but in the next shot, she's using her right. When Steven picks up the box, it's upside down in this shot, but in this shot, it's right side up. I have a plan. Or should I say, we have a plan. Why exactly does Garnet decide to take the diplomacy route now of all times? Seriously, this problem could probably be solved a hundred times faster if the gems didn't randomly decide they want to be peaceful. And even better, why did they make Garnet the person who comes up with the plan and not Steven? Usually Garnet's all about punching things, not talking to them. I get it might be different since Ruby is a part of Garnet and thus they might not want to immediately resort to violence, but surely the fact that they're homeworld gems would override that. And also, Ruby and Sapphire's gems look straight up flat in this shot. Ruby's gem disappears at multiple points in this episode. It's the core of their entire being, and they can't even draw that on them consistently. They want to search the barn! Can't she just leave the barn? Especially with that giant hole in the back. There's no reason for Peridot to just stick around there when they're about to search it. Just go out there and tell them this is a place where humans live. Ah, uh, yeah, it's not like there was a huge fucking war where homeworld gems killed humans. They will definitely not want to disturb any humans around the area. No such thing as a good war, kiddo. Gems were destroyed. People too. <laughs> Looks like we failed. Failed. You have to, uh, play baseball. On the one hand, I kind of appreciate the idea of a joke that no one would really pay much attention to being the catalyst for an episode's main plot. It's kind of neat, even if it is a trope. But then again, this is where the plot ended up going. Baseball. Instead of being an interesting episode with new homeworld gems in which we can learn something new or even have some sort of big fight, we instead bend logic to have a basic-ass baseball episode trope. The gems are completely out of character, and the rubies are pretty much willing to waste their time despite being on a mission directly from Yellow Diamond. All for baseball. Lovely. I saw that this was a possibility, though I am surprised that this is the path we're taking. Would you file that under an improbable future? Because if so, then there's no way Garnet should have been able to see this. Especially since she barely even knows what baseball is. Army's unibrow keeps disappearing over the course of the episode. 
In this shot, Steven has a catching glove in his left hand, but when he's tagging Eyeball out here, it's on his right. So either Steven just has two catching gloves he switches between for some reason, or it's just inconsistency. Which do you believe more? Ruby's hand is backwards in this shot. Ouch. I know the Rubies are dumb, but how do they not see Ruby's actions as suspicious with how she's interacting with the humans? Especially when she starts helping one of them. Everything's gonna be a-okay. You're lying to me! To make you feel better! Thank you! No one's really standing over at this blackboard while the final play is going on, so what's the point of having a spot to keep track of balls and strikes? Ruby, stop being cute, and Sapphire, keep your eye on the ball. Pun intended? What did I just say? Just look at the ball. I'm trying, but all I want to look at is you. This is indicative of a larger problem that me and Noah have with Garnet, but don't you think that comments like that are signs of an unhealthy relationship? It's one thing for Ruby and Sapphire to want to be around each other as much as possible while they're separated, and it's also one thing for them to casually flirt. That's mostly fine. The issue is when it's implied that Sapphire can't even begin to concentrate on doing something very important without wanting to focus primarily on Ruby. Maybe I'm reading too far into this one comment, sure. But when the life of one of your own is potentially at stake, and Sapphire still just wants to concentrate on Ruby all the time, there's clearly a problem. Plus, there's a larger conversation to be had about how wanting to put every waking second of your time and energy into the other person in a relationship is very, very unhealthy, and how a relationship like that is touted by the show as the perfect relationship. But I feel that's something to be explored another time. The only important note here is that their relationship looks so unhealthy at the moment, that they're literally putting the life of one of their friends at risk for all they know. In between these two shots, the ice on the bat just completely disappears. Maybe there was some kind of explosion that made the ice melt and that's what it's insinuating? But then why didn't the bat immediately break in half? <laughs> And Noah's point from earlier is substantiated even more by the fact that the game didn't even end up mattering. So what the fuck was the point of having them play baseball instead of anything remotely interesting? Because baseball episode. Also, Ruby's headband disappears in this shot. Also, also, Ruby and Sapphire's gems are in the wrong spots, and they have the same cuts on them when they shouldn't. Come back! Yeah, don't stop them from fusing or anything. Eyeball's gem in this fusion is oriented the wrong way in this shot. Neptune! She's on the planet Neptune! Or you could just tell them the truth? I don't see why you can't just tell them the last place you saw her and then go about your day. Considering the fact that they didn't want to hurt humans, they seem like they don't want to cause any trouble. Or you could just poof them. We see later that the gems have no trouble fighting the rubies after they fuse. So why not just take them out now and move on? Telling them that Jasper's on Neptune just seems pointless as they're obviously going to come back like they did later on. Yeah, it's a human thing. You might have seen a house fly, maybe even a super fly, but I bet you ain't never seen a Steven fly. Written and storyboarded by one person. Uh-oh. We're finally home! Yep, weird looking eyes. That about checks out. Hello, bed! What the fuck was that about? Pearl clearly must be losing every ounce of her sanity according to this shot. Did that cake go bad? That was a cake? The big donut is closed! Did you not check the time before walking outside? There's gotta be at least one in here. The problem isn't the lack of donuts in the store. The problem is you being unable to get to said donuts. Why not just have Steven say something like, you gotta let me have at least one. I'm just starving. I think fish pizza is still open. I don't know if I'm hungry enough for a meal. But you're starving? No, I'm dying. I could even learn how to lie. Was that close-up really necessary? It's great to be back!
You know, I'm noticing a trend here. I get that Steven is slowly getting more used to his gem and is having more and more of his powers unlocked as time goes on, but it seems like they're always introduced or messed with after some big event so that the Kruniverse doesn't have to ride around it. After Ocean Gem, Steven arbitrarily loses his healing powers in a way that doesn't make sense. After the return and jailbreak, Steven starts to get the hang of his shield and bubble and uses them more often. And now after the whole drill fiasco, he suddenly gets the power to jump really high and float? The only real place I've seen a newly introduced power get some use in a big situation is Steven healing Lapis's gem. And even after that, the Kruniverse practically disables it for a season and a half. Why? I wish we'd see these powers earlier, or at least have them built up to in some way so that scenes like this don't completely come out of nowhere. First of all, where the hell is the lighthouse in this shot? Secondly, Steven jumps straight up from the lighthouse here, so how did he get all the way to over the ocean? The following shots don't signify at all that he jumped at an angle or that the wind carried him, so what happened? Steven just stops descending altogether in this shot, which must mean the situation has somehow made him so happy that the descent is slow to a stop. Can Steven fly? Yeah, I think I remember that. No, no, I think he can laugh this. How do you even begin to confuse those two with each other? Look, I get it. It's meant to be a joke, and I'm probably reading too far into it. But there's making a joke that Amethyst would naturally make, and then there's making Amethyst seem downright stupid just for the sake of a joke. And the latter is really bad writing, in my opinion. I'll catch you, Steven! I think it's gonna be oh. a while. Oh. I found a phone. Whose is it? That's not important. Can I just say that the gems absolutely make the comedic aspect of this episode? The animation and voice acting of the gems completely nail it. At the rate that he's descending, Steven should have hit the ground by now, right? Or at the very least, he should be close enough to the point where he doesn't need the phone to communicate because it's been literal hours. There's no time to explain! It would take five seconds at the most. Is there anything else you can put on me? Just this alarm clock. That is such a contrived way to show him the time. Firstly, you already have the alarm clock on you, so it's technically already a part of what's weighing him down. Secondly, don't the pizzas have a car you can grab and use? I'm sure there's heavier stuff if you look around. Thirdly, that alarm clock is so tiny that it would barely make a difference anyway. And fourthly, how did 30 minutes pass when all the gems did was grab a few items? What, did they try for that long before they realized this wouldn't work. What the fuck is wrong with these people's eyes in this shot? Alas, poor Steven. Why do they have Sadie's voice say this line when for everybody else they just had Steven say their lines? I assume it's a budget thing so that they didn't have to pay the other voice actors for just one line, but it's still a little jarring. I dropped my phone. When the fuck did that happen? Seriously, it never shows him dropping it. That's plot convenience at its finest. My floating power's tied to my emotions! Bullshit. You cannot possibly tell me that not only was Steven happy the entire night, but the whole time he was panicking about not being able to make it to the big donut, he was also happy. There's a lot of things I can suspend my disbelief about in this show, but that is not one of them. Mom? Oh geez, those feelings are complicated. He's used the memories of happy and sad things to land safely behind us, ready to give us a hug. I could even learn how to love. Okay, okay, but in all seriousness, he's dead, right? It looked like he was moving at the same velocity as when he was upset, and considering that he didn't die, does that mean this whole segment didn't have any tension at all? And actually, now that I think about it, those happy thoughts didn't slow his velocity at all either. So either Steven seriously values him being first to try a donut over his family, or Steven's powers are bullshit. Or it could be both, I guess. Steven has his flip-flops on in this shot when he threw them down earlier. I also highly doubt that he'd take the time to find them and put them on before running to hug the gems. So yeah, it's an animation error. Okay. I would have liked a hug. I thought I was late. Late? We always open at 7.30 on Sundays. How convenient. I would call contrivance, but honestly, this is such a small plot point and the conclusion is nice enough to where I'm not going to question it too much. Still worth a sin, though. My face! Also, oh bother is a very random line to end the episode with. I 
respecting your privacy by knocking, but asserting my authority as your father by coming in anyway! Looks like this is another one of those episodes where Steven looks like a tiny baby man. It's a little jarring when you go from Steven floats where he has normal looking limbs to this mess. The way that the animation of Steven pushing this cart works with the background here looks off. You'd think there'd be a bit of bumpiness after the cart rolls from the pavement to this uneven dirt, but nope. It makes it look like the grass is painted brown or something. If he wants to muh, muh, muh so much about it, he doesn't have to come. That was not at all the issue he had with you DJing, but okay. With how close the camera was in that last shot, this bus should be a lot closer than it actually is here. You mean your rotten old manager? I'll protect you, Dad! Don't worry, I got a hose. Sorry, Mr. You. I totally clogged up your toy. Why would you point away from where the bathroom is when you're referring to clogging the toilet? When did you get so tall? Like nine years ago? Whoa. <laughs> hmm. With how skinny Greg's head looks in this shot, he looks even more thumb-like than usual. Marty's eyes are black in this shot, when in the next shot and throughout the rest of the episode, they're blue. Just getting ready to set up for this semi-annual DJ night rave thing I do in Beach City. Do you really need to put that much detail into your explanation of what you're doing? I've decided to hang out in Beach City and, um, make up for lost time with you. And while we're chilling, I'll promote your little engagement. How does Sour Cream not see right through this? Seriously, his father was out of his life for nine years. When he does show up again, it doesn't even seem to be for him. He makes up excuse after excuse for being gone so long. I'd assume Vidalia would have mentioned her disdain for Marty at least once in the almost decade he's been gone, right? So surely some red flags would be ringing in Sour Cream's head when not even a minute after meeting up again, Marty immediately starts talking business with him. Not to mention later on he gets super controlling of the event, yet Sour Cream just lets him do it. Look, even Steven isn't buying this shit, and he's probably the most naive person here. What kind of cord is plugged into this Game Boy here? A power cable? The regular Game Boy's power cable looks closer to a laptop charger than it does this kind of cable. In fact, this kind of power cable looks like one from a Game Boy Advance, so the real question to ask might be what kind of Game Boy is this? Steven looks like he's about to activate the suction protocol here. What kind of horrible advertisement marks the location as at beach? I don't know if Marty's just trying to advertise to the locals or what, but that's so incredibly vague either way. What beach where? Give us some kind of general direction or location. Specify! Let me rap with you about the setup I have envisioned, okay? Okay, I know his lingo is supposed to be out of touch and cringy, but let me rap with you about is on such a higher level of dumb that I think I have to take off a sin for nailing the prompt. These handles look like stickers. They have no depth to them whatsoever. Just a humble roadie doing a mic check. This mic looks great. Whoa! Yeah! It's some guy! To a brand new soda! What? Wa-cola! How the fuck did he manage to hide this entirely from Sour Cream? Or I guess the more important question is, how did Sour Cream not notice any of the signs that there was going to be some kind of sponsor here? Did he not get a look inside the bus? Did he just not look at the stuff under the tarp and assume it was a speaker or something? Because honestly, that's one hell of a miracle that he just didn't look at any of the several signs. This is terrible! What the- from concentrate? Isn't most soda made from some kind of concentrate? Hell, I'm pretty sure most soft drinks are made from concentrate, so I doubt that's actually the problem. I know I might be overthinking this, but the fact that Steven is seemingly attributing the soda's terribleness to it being made from concentrate is strange, considering that a lot of drinks are made from the stuff. I only came here because I'm legally obligated to give you this. If that was the only reason, then this was a gigantic as fuck sidetrack. I don't know if he was planning on doing something here anyway and just roped sour cream into it on a whim, but since that wasn't really explained, this whole thing feels a little contrived. Considering how fast Yellowtail is going here, it's a miracle any of the DJ equipment he's carrying doesn't get absolutely drenched. <laughs> Why is this part so much louder than the rest of the episode? Seriously, the volume jumps up like six decibels in my editing software. Has the Crooniverse heard of audio normalization?
This video is sponsored by Gua Cola, the only soda made from three whole avocados. Guy, you sell out, motherfucker! Hey, wait, what are you doing here? Wait, no, 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 no! I was fine with the men. Stop singing! This is some weird looking static. Also, how is this commercial being shown here exactly? The VCR-like interface leads me to think it's a VHS tape of some sort, but Marty didn't give Greg anything like that, and I doubt it would fit in an envelope. And if it's on live TV, then why would you need the VCR interface, and how would Greg have turned to a channel that played that ad at exactly the right time? Steven's eyebrow disappears in this frame. So this episode is a musical, and if you remember my thoughts on the movie, you might think that I don't like that approach. But actually, I think this episode is a musical done correctly. Mainly because 11 minutes of songs is a lot more focused and coherent than an hour and a half of songs. The movie had songs that added basically nothing and felt like padding, while every song here, with the exception of one, has great value. I'm not going to play the songs, otherwise Turner is going to have a field day taking on my ad rep. Revenue. So for the sake of not bogging the video's pace down, I'm gonna subtract a sin for Don't Cost Nothing and it's Reprise, Mr. Greg, and it's over, isn't it? They're all really good songs. I could put you through college. But I'm with the gems all the time. That's not a counter argument. It's not like you're chained to the gems at all times and you'll be punished for being away from them. And maybe he means that they'd give him more knowledge than college ever could and so he doesn't really need it. But considering how sheltered and unknowledgeable on some earth things the gems are, that doesn't really make sense either. Again, can't really play the copyrighted audio, so you'll have to trust me on this one. Greg's strumming is nowhere close to being in time with the music here. So in that list earlier, you may have noticed that there are two big songs missing. I'm gonna go over one of them later for a special reason, but as for the other one, well... I know a place that's always exciting, the shows and the sights and the lights that are blinding. I don't really like Empire City. The instrumental is okay, but all of the lyrics are either generic or just really fucking stupid. I know a place that's always exciting, the shows and the sights and the lights so blinding. Empire City! And let's bring Pearl. That's probably the one good part of the song, though. Past experiences have taught me that three's a crowd. That's in terms of relationships and or fusion, not friendly outings. There's a difference. Just you, me, Pearl, and don't forget Mom. Steven either has no earthly idea what reading the room means, or he's doing this awkward shit on purpose. And yes, he's somewhat doing this to close the gap between Pearl and Greg, but he didn't have to make it awkward by shouting that little tidbit out loud. Also, Greg's tan line on his right arm is black in this shot when it's the correct color on his left arm. Ah yes, my favorite headline. News, 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 news! It's really strange seeing neat little details like this cute advertisement for a new dollcopter movie alongside stuff like this. When the fuck did he have this made? It's probably a personal thing he had made just for fun, that's fair. But then why does Greg think showing it to this guy will do anything but confuse him? Greg's eyebrows are the same color as his beard in this shot when they're supposed to be the same color as his hair. And he's here to spend his dough all over the town. Or he could just need a hotel for the night and he has no intention to spend anything extra in Empire City? Nothing was really communicated here, so why is that the immediate assumption? Greg's tan on his legs is reversed in this shot. For reference, this is what it's supposed to look like. It's all deluxe. It's all deluxe. When you're dining out with me, it's the finest steak and brie. That finest steak already looks like it has a bite taken out of it. The tan is reversed in this shot, too. This city's got its charm, unlike that termite-ridden barn. I'm pretty sure even the most two-star hotel in the world would have more charm than a goddamn barn. Maybe later. Ooh, you ruined the song! Greg's hair and beard are the same color in this shot when they should be different colors. And for Pearl's next hat trick, she'll make her mouth disappear. 
This spinning shot looks really weird. For one thing, the background is spinning way faster than Pearl is, so is she herself spinning and the camera's just following her at an awkward speed? And even so, the building she's standing on the balcony of doesn't even appear in this shot at all. So I guess this is an abstract background? But then why make that abstract background look almost identical to the city background outside? Not to mention this shot lasts for 25 seconds. So this just strikes me as cool spinning shot that we can use so we can take a break from animating body motion without putting much thought into where Pearl is and what her surroundings are. And it's really unfortunate that they took this approach because when they do fully animate Pearl, it's some really good and dynamic stuff. Her dancing on the glass here is honestly pretty mesmerizing and her animation during the song as a whole is fantastic. I've also got to highlight this part of the song specifically, which is so good it gives me legitimate chills. And she loved you and she's gone. You were awake. You were literally screaming at one point. How could they not wake up to that? Ugh, cherry man. That's another nice little callback I really appreciate. Wait, so what was the plan here? Did Steven really expect to just drag Pearl here kicking and screaming and expect them to immediately talk out their problems? Yeah, what I said earlier, I really think Steven does have no fucking idea what he's doing. Why don't you talk to each other? This is the other song I wanted to wait for because this is quite possibly my favorite song in all of Steven Universe. And if not, then it's definitely up there. The instrumental is really beautiful. The visuals are probably the best in the episode. Steven's singing really pulls it all together. It's just a masterpiece in all honesty. There are some future songs that come close, but there's nothing that can really top both of you. It's just the best, in my opinion. Greg's hair and beard color are almost the same color again, but this time his beard is a darker color than his hair, which is, again, wrong. I know these are all really petty, but they're still errors. You'll have to trust me on this one again, but there's a solid second here where Steven just stops playing, yet the song indicates he should actually be hitting more keys. I know these instrument-related sins are probably my biggest nitpicks to date, but it comes off as really jarring to me when a character playing an instrument doesn't at least attempt to match the music that's playing. I knew how you felt about Rose, and I stayed anyway. That wasn't the problem. Then what was? She fell in love with you. Well, you know Rose. She, she always, always did, did what she wanted. wanted. And that's that mental hurdle solved. No, really. That last sentence, which added almost nothing of value to the conversation, was apparently enough to overcome the roadblock stopping Pearl from fully getting along with Greg. It's such an odd sentence. Of course Rose did what she wanted in terms of a relationship. Don't most people? I get that Greg and Pearl probably just needed to talk to each other about Rose to fully be able to move on from it, but I'm not buying that that disaster of a sentence fixed anything. What? Just fill it to my bank. Oh, look, that's me. That's me coming, like, coming with a big doorway, with ducking my head down because I'm so f tall. Was this documented? You two ready to go or what? Go? Why didn't you tell her about this beforehand so that you didn't catch her off guard? The stars on Amethyst's pants are missing in this shot. In this shot, Steven just has regular shoes and not sandals. That's honestly really weird and surreal to see. Also, no, Steven Universe Wiki, Peridot does not have six fingers on her right hand in either this shot or the next one. I can give them the benefit of the doubt here, though, because counting the fingers on this hand specifically makes it feel more like an optical illusion than a hand drawing. That's more than likely just me, though. Is Mr. Smiley not even going to slightly question how these two grew so much in a short period of time? Not even a small check to make sure they aren't cheating the system in some way? Considering how the mirror works here, shouldn't Steven's pants in this reflection come above his knees rather than covering his legs entirely? The skin on Steven's legs should still at least be reflected in the mirror. I don't think even a hall of mirrors could actively cover that up. Also, I find it incredibly hard to believe that Peridot would be so hung up on not being able to shapeshift that she would ignore the mirror in front of her that I'm sure she'd be at least a little interested in. Surely something like this wouldn't have been on Homeworld due to a lack of usefulness, and so she'd want to at least ask about it. 
You're working the ring toss, too? Yeah, you can say we're a little funder staff. <laughs> I get it. I'm glad you're seeing the humor in it, Steven, because I haven't seen a bed in six days. Oh. Peridot's visor disappears here, only to reappear when she takes her hands away from her eyes. Is that Onion trying to light the roller coaster on fire? I'm not falling for that one again. Oh! Uh, no! I'm still paying off the last lawsuit! I also do not steal Steven's clothes when he's not looking. What? Would you look at that? And I thought this thing was red. Then you should be questioning this win at least a little bit, shouldn't you? They're saying something for relatable humor, and then there's making a character look like an idiot. How exactly is this supposed to help Peridot shapeshift? I thought you just had to think about what you want to be and then just shake it out. So either that advice was a fucking lie, or they're severely overcomplicating this process for the sake of a montage. Also, they make Peridot's impression of a cat here look like she's falling asleep at the wheel after a long day of nitpicking. Actually, pretty relatable. Now this is just a game of catch. How is this gonna help? And no, it's not like it makes you practice shape-shifting your arms because Steven bounces the ball up to Peridot's head, which doesn't require shape-shifting to catch. Maybe we just have to activate it manually. You grab her feet, I grab the arms. Okay. It's not bad enough that this is even considered. It's that Steven fucking goes along with it without question. And honestly, this whole part makes me kind of squeamish considering that they seem to straight up ignore Peridot's cries of pain. This isn't going to work. Peridot's voice should be muffled here. I knew. Resources are dwindling on Homeworld. They can't make gems like they used to. Just a fair warning, I'm about to go on a long, long nerdy tirade here. On the one hand, I can really appreciate that the crew universe puts little bits of lore into episodes like this. To keep the fans engaged, even in episodes where the overarching story progression is minimal. But on the other hand, this info comes right the fuck out of nowhere, and in an episode about a fun time at an amusement park, this just feels odd to include. And I think I know what they were going for. They were writing a more introspective Peridot, discovering more and more how flawed Homeworld really was. But I feel there was a much better place this explanation could have been put, and that's in Beta. Peridot could still think about all this up until that point, and then when the topic of the Beta Kindergarten comes up, she goes and explains how it works with Steven and Amethyst. Then as she does this, it slowly begins to dawn on her just how desperate Homeworld were when they were making Era 2 gems. And then she applies it to herself. Could that be why she had this inadequate feeling at Funland? Could she have been made actively worse than earlier gems of her kind? And if so, then how does that make her feel? It could actually be even more interesting because of how they show Jasper's entry hole being practically flawless. Did Homeworld focus most of their resources into other more superior gems? Leaving gems like Peridot to suffer in the long term? How would Peridot cope with knowing that the place she learned and served all her life thought she was just a replaceable asset that was made in Interior, possibly deliberately just to save on some petty resources. I'd say that opens up a lot of opportunity to write Peridot as someone who has to navigate this existential problem and learn that just because she was made on a budget doesn't make her any less important. But putting this lesson here really hurts that approach. Because this isn't established in an environment like the Beta Kindergarten, which seems tailor-made for stories like these. It's established in a slice of life episode set in a fucking amusement amusement park. You know, the place typically built for people to forget about their problems. There's a bigger point to be made here about how overlooked I feel Peridot's character in this series is as a whole, but this is already long enough as it is. Just know that I think this moment would have been better served later in the season. Stop playing with that thing. Give me that. No! You don't need it. You don't know that! Yes, I do! Where is this coming from? Amethyst saying that Peridot doesn't need the tablet comes right the hell out of nowhere when the only thing Peridot really did wrong was not listen to her. The cause and effect don't really line up in that regard, so that makes this whole sequence feel really contrived. Maybe Amethyst thinks the tablet is partly to blame for Peridot feeling down about herself, but that feels even more out of nowhere. I don't think Peridot's insecurities are coming from being on that tablet. They seem a lot more deeply rooted than that. And I think even Amethyst would know that considering her experiences. I don't know. This whole scene comes off as just needing a way to introduce Peridot's metal powers. So they wrote first and asked questions later. That's 10, all right. Well, I guess you won fair and square. It's a wonder this guy doesn't get fired for how much money he probably loses this place.
Eating poop would be better than this. <laughs> Part of me really doubts that Sadie would be amused by Lars' comment there, and instead would be at least a tiny bit upset that Lars is being rude to Steven, even if she does agree with him. Hey Steven, you're staring a little bit. No, I'm not. Yeah, even my least favorite episode of Steven Universe has some funny bits, surprisingly. Hey Lars? Is the lip syncing here so off that Steven said hey Lars a second before his mouth moved? Or is it supposed to be that he said something that we don't get to hear? Because either way, that looks wrong. Also, despite the fact that this episode has two people storyboarding it, this is one of those uncanny facial expression episodes. So maybe it's not the amount, but more so who's storyboarding it. But I'm not about to single out names or anything like that, I'll just add three sins to account for this. I know how you feel about Sadie. You don't know what you're talking about, so butt out. Why can't you just admit you love her? And so it begins. It is entirely out of character for Steven to be this pushy and to impose his will onto others this heavily. I get he's only 14 and the teenagers can be ignorant to the fact that the world doesn't revolve around them, but Steven of all people thinking this? Steven, who has constantly cared and been receptive to everyone's feelings, suddenly gets written as this whiny bitch who is actively in denial of others' feelings. And that's not even taking into account how obsessive he is about this to the point where he's even dreaming about it. That's next level in terms of bad writing. I would expect this from the dark age of SpongeBob or something like Fanboy and Chum Chum, not Steven fucking universe. And get a load of this line. You don't need to be such a jerk all the time. I know Lars isn't the greatest person in this show, but it would be one thing if Steven said something like this when Lars was actually insulting him. You know, like when he did it in season 1A and it was one of that season's best moments. But the context changes completely when Steven calls Lars a jerk for... Daring not to date someone. That's not being a jerk, that's being human. And that's also a concept that I think Steven should have grasped by now. And okay, there is a counterpoint to this that I do think is fair, but I want to go over it later when I think it'll be most relevant. So let's hold off on that for now. This isn't the temple. This isn't my voice. Oh, I'm Lars? Ooh, I'm naked! This is fucked up on so many levels. So much so that I think I need to add some context here. Let's start with Steven's mind transfer power itself, which according to the wiki is only really used for three episodes. Out of these three episodes, only one should showed Steven being able to possess a human, that being this one. For now, let's put aside the fact that this power is sorely underused and that it was really contrived in the first place. Why does it manifest now? Are you meaning to tell me that Steven's distress over his goddamn shit being in danger was so strong that it unlocked his ability to literally possess people? There are several startling implications that could be gleaned from that observation, but let's start with the idea that the Kroonoverse decided to cross that line and write some very questionable things with it. Like Steven seeing Lars naked. Was that really necessary? It's just so wrong and creepy, and honestly a little disgusting that that joke was even considered. We'll go over this more as the episode progresses, but just know that giving Steven this power was a terrible idea, the way he uses this power turns it into an abysmal idea, and by the end the idea will be so toxic that I have to wonder what the hell the Kroonoverse were even thinking. But despite this, credit where credit is due, Lars' voice actor nails it when he acts like Steven. You can really tell the difference, it's genuinely incredible. And while we're at it, Lars' animation throughout the episode has done really well too. You can tell it's Steven in there. I'm gonna be tearing this episode a new one throughout probably 95% of this video, but this is a part of it I can respect. Lars' reflection in the mirror here doesn't seem quite right. Shouldn't the mirror only be showing the back of his head and none of his face? I, Lars, promise to go out and do my very best being your son. I can really understand the sentiment here, and some people might view this as a positive change Steven is trying to make in Lars' life. However, despite the idea of this change being good, that doesn't really change the fact that Steven is making a promise that he's not sure Lars is going to be able to keep. It's shitty that he's potentially setting Lars' parents up for devastation, unless he's planning to stay in Lars' body forever, which could be a genuine implication of this line. Ugh. I'm Lars! Hey, Onion, look, I'm Lars! Dad made me work this morning. Now I stink like pizza and fish. You don't stink. Lars, what a nice thing to say! That's so 
basic though. And Jenny treats it like it's some big nice gesture. Is Lars really that cold towards people that he himself wanted to try and be friends with? I really doubt that. Unless it's either Lars trying super hard to fit in even after learning the lesson that he doesn't have to, or it's just this episode's god awful writing making the old Lars out to be as shitty as possible. Maybe Lars is actually a good guy who likes making people feel good. And I'm starting to think it's the latter. Again, I know Lars is kind of a jerk, but right now this episode is writing him as if he was some completely insufferable prick. And to me, that comes off as gross in the context of an episode where Steven's idea of Lars being a jerk is not dating someone he wants them to. Lars is gonna be psyched. Buck is pleased. Fangs of love. I think I'd rather have my organs pickled. Despite this very horribly, incredibly awkward situation that's playing out in front of us right now, the fact that I'm able to at least chuckle at lines like this one shows that the Crooniverse are still very good at writing jokes like that. They just sometimes use their writing ability to create war crimes like this episode, that's all. Yesterday, I asked if you wanted to come over, but you made a big deal saying no in front of Steven. And now, you're here? It's getting to be kind of a roller coaster, isn't it? Roller coasters are fun. Remember that counterpoint I was talking about earlier? Some people might say that Steven is a sheltered kid who's oblivious to social cues and that this line is proof of that. Hell, I might even somewhat agree with that considering how blunt he could be about things in Mr. Greg. However, I want you guys to remember that Steven is the same kid who helped mend the relationship between Greg and Pearl in one of the best episodes of the show. How in the fuck can he go from that to being this oblivious? I don't think this is him being sheltered. This episode is just written awfully. How do you really feel about me? Isn't it obvious? I love you! Wow, they really went there. I think we all knew how this was going to end, but I'm still speechless. I cannot believe that an episode where Steven forcibly shoves two people together, one of which was very clearly against the idea, was greenlit. This is quite possibly the worst scene of this entire show. In context, it so blatantly fumbles on Steven's very character that after I first watched this episode, it took me forever to start liking Steven as a character again. That's how horrid this scene is is. I just wanted to fix everything. Just another friendly reminder that Steven is implying that Lars not confessing to Sadie is broken somehow and that it needs to be fixed. How are your guys' opinions on Steven holding up right now? Mine are going great! So does this mean Lars's mind is inside your body? I don't know. You don't know? It really says something that Steven, eager to try and fix Lars' life because he supposedly cares about him so much, didn't give a single solitary thought to where Lars' mind might be right now. For all he knows, his mind could have overwritten Lars' mind or something, thus leaving Lars effectively dead. So we've escalated from not thinking about how his actions might further complicate Lars' life to not thinking about if his actions have even left Lars alive. Live. Fantastic! Where's he going? Who is that girl? Let's follow him and find out. Holy shit, this is so contrived. First of all, what reasons would the cool kids have to run after Lars and Sadie here? Do they think something's wrong? If so, you'd think at least one of them would call and find out or just shout Lars' name out before running after them. Secondly, this is the first episode we see Lars' parents out like this. And it's super convenient that they just so happen to see Lars while they're outside, then just so happen to decide to follow him. Why? They don't even sound concerned either, just curious. So they have no reason to not call out his name and ask him. Neither group does. This looks weird, but don't jump to conclusions. 25 seconds later, they go ahead and jump to conclusions. Bear in mind, all they see at this point is Lars trying desperately to wake up an unresponsive Steven. Why do they then think his intentions were to hurt Steven? For all they know, Lars and Sadie could have gotten worried about Steven and went to make sure he was okay. They then saw Steven unconscious, potentially not okay, then tried to wake him up. But now, let's assume the worst possible scenario so that this episode can continue to make the old Lars look as bad as possible. I spent the day with my mind in your body. <sighs> ah! Whoa, where's your chill? Are they deaf? You mean to tell me that they expect Lars to remain perfectly calm and collected after being told that a different person had complete 
fucking control over his body for a day? Lars is supposed to be chill about that? I usually try to keep my cool in these videos nowadays, so I apologize if this screaming comes off as rather sudden. But we've now devolved to such atrocious writing that this episode is now actively bullying Lars, throwing logic and reasoning out the window just to jab him further. This episode is so unnecessarily cruel and is also starting to be genuinely toxic. I'm really, really sorry about yesterday. I got you a card. It's got a koala and a slot. This is just fucking insulting. After his actions could have genuinely hampered Lars' life, all he can offer as an apology is a goddamn card that references the stuff that Lars was annoyed with in the first place. What a joke. I said you loved her. And what did she say? She thought you'd only say something like that to hurt her. I guess she's right. Maybe that's why everyone liked the you me better than the real me. And there it is. I know I sound like a broken record when I say that I know Lars is supposed to be a jerk, but it's important to bring that up because of this line. Can you imagine if someone took control of your body for a day, and then afterwards you get told something that makes you think that people liked that person more than you? That you, someone who Try so desperately for people to like you are not only replaceable, but that your replacement would be seen as better? Wouldn't you be absolutely devastated? That is the nastiest part of this episode to me. Because while it does try to remedy this by showing that someone does care about Lars, it doesn't feel genuine at all. This episode spent most of its runtime spelling out how much the old Lars has messed up in his personal life and his general shortcomings as a character. And instead of offering a proper episode, that could teach people how they can recover from such mistakes, they instead spend it with another character trying to fix things that aren't broken under the pretense that Lars' personal decision to not want to date someone was one of the things that were broken. It gives off the impression that you have to become an entirely different person to be seen as likable to the majority of people, as well as put yourself in an uncomfortable position to make people happy, which is really fucking dangerous advice to be peddling. And you might think that this episode is trying to show that a viewpoint like Steve Stevens is wrong and it shouldn't be followed, but nope. Steven gets absolutely zero form of punishment or guidance from either Sadie or Lars. He's just let off the hook for this. It's so abominable. And I wouldn't be surprised if people who relate to Lars' situation portrayed in this episode now feel less confident about themselves than they did before. It's no fucking wonder that Lars only saw proper character development in space where the writers effectively soft reboot him. I don't think I've ever seen more contempt for a character than I have here. And I know what some of you are probably going to say in response to that. That's what happens when you take an episode too seriously. This episode is clearly meant to be a jokey humorous episode. You're just overanalyzing it. No. If Steven Universe wants to make a funny haha -ha episode, they have episodes like Garnet's Universe and parts of Log Date 7142 to go off of. An episode that does nothing but bully another character, one that shows nothing but a character's problems without making any kind of point or statement on how to make things better, one that shows a blatantly toxic viewpoint on how someone's life should be fixed and then fails to properly debunk that line of thinking, and an episode that has the gall to say and do all that, while only then making a passing mention at how all this affects said character's mental health, that's not a humorous episode. That's a fucking atrocity. Easily the worst episode in all of Steven Universe. No contest. I rest my case. Oh, and a copy of Steven's fingers just floats here in this frame. some fun i got some kicking music and i'm ready to see you drive get those coins out of your pocket throw them in the machine and let's get started Steven's height in this entire scene is very inconsistent. He starts with his head barely past Connie's shoulders, then it's up to about her eye level, then it's up to her forehead. Not to mention that between these two shots specifically, Steven and Connie both get a spontaneous growth spurt. This show desperately needed model sheets. I love that car. I wanted that car. Kevin drives over this huge ass water puddle, but not even a drop of water flies out from it. Kevin. 
I don't know whether it's funny or inconsistent that Steven holds the typical high school bully in more contempt than people who have literally tried to get him and his friends killed. I guess it could be both, but I view it more on the funny side since Kevin never really changes or is remorseful for the things he did, and he's meant to be a more one-dimensional bad guy anyway, so. Hey, you forgot to- Eh, what do I care, I'm rich. When we fused into Stevani, we met him at the dance and- He was a creep! Steven! I can understand not wanting your son to hate someone, but not wanting him to say someone's a creep? That's not really being hateful and more so sharing a bad experience. Why would you want to discourage that? My practice didn't pay off at all. That was so bad. You're driving a fucking pizza delivery car. What did you think was gonna happen? That's why I knew those brats at the car wash. They're you. That's an observation that comes almost entirely out of nowhere and one that he seriously should have had sooner. You'd think that Stevani diffusing into two kids would be at least a little memorable to Kevin. You've had a taste of Kevin and now you're obsessed. Oh God. With the way this bird's legs are drawn, it doesn't really look like it's standing on the sign as much as it looks like it's stabbing its legs into it. I'd like to point out that neither Steven or Connie have had any experience driving, nor do they have much of a clue as to anything that was popular before their time, yet they're driving a stick shift car and doing fancy shit with it flawlessly. The power of suspension of disbelief knows no bounds. According to this shot, Kevin had absolutely no room to come up next to Stevani. Yet in this shot, here he is. What, did the road magically widen between that shot and this one? Actually, considering this show's track record, that's very possible, and that thought scares me. What reason do Stevani and Kevin have to drift here? This looks like a straight road. Actually, it doesn't even look like drifting. They're just driving sideways. Don't worry about it. I can't play much of it, lest Turner drive all my ad revenue off a cliff, but I really like this little moment here. It's the first indicator in this show that there are some people out there who are assholes just because they feel like it, with no signs of them wanting to change. It's small, yeah, but I can dig that Steven Universe shows both people who are able to be redeemed and those beyond redemption. It makes its characters feel more realistic, in a way. What are we doing? We're getting Kevin back! We're about to beat him at his own game! They've been sitting on the road doing absolutely nothing for who knows how long against a car that's just as fast, if not faster than theirs. I don't think they're gonna be doing anything but feeding Kevin's ego at this point. And the fact that Steven still thinks otherwise is baffling to say the least. Or maybe not. Did Kevin let them catch up? It doesn't look like he was moving any slower, and surely the rest of the cast would have noticed if Kevin slowed down, right? I don't know. This whole sequence is kind of confusing. Second place isn't so bad for my first time driving a car. Except that second place is technically last place in this context, so that makes literally zero sense. There's not letting someone get to you, and then there's just being plain delusional. Ah yes, my favorite character, Pearl Dee, being played by my favorite actress, Mango Hall. First place, baby. It's like I invented with. Okay, you see what he did? He french fried when he should have pizza. You french fry when you pizza, you're gonna have a bad time. I love going to my local fry shop to get a look at the famous white rectangle. They were way back in the freezer for some reason. Considering that the last time those mozzarella sticks were served up was likely years ago, I sure hope those didn't go bad. Otherwise, this store is either gonna have a lawsuit or three very angry crystal gems on their hands. Kofi is just kind of chilling by the door here as Steven walks by. He doesn't move an inch until Steven comes into view, and he's not even looking directly at Steven. So does he spend most of his shift staring out the window at passersby, waiting for someone to harass into eating at his shop? Makes you think, doesn't it? So... Any mention of someone else selling fries enables Frymen to teleport to their location, apparently. No, but seriously, there's no way he walked over that fast. I fail to see the correlation between these two restaurants warring and everyone suddenly turning into slobs that throw their trash onto the boardwalk. 
The fry shop still has these signs advertising their fry business, despite Fryman himself saying that they're out of fries, and despite him also wanting to really focus on their new pizza thing. Doesn't seem like very good advertising, but hey, what do I know? I was the one who wanted to shake things up. Oh, yeah. It's your fault. As much as that comes off as a joke, that seems a little mean-spirited, doesn't it? I get it's coming from Petey, but I think that's harsh even coming from him. Could I just get some fries? Sorry, we're all out of fries. I think that completely getting rid of the thing that you used to be known for wouldn't be a very lucrative business practice. In fact, I'd think keeping the fries around would make for a more entertaining plot about realizing that you can't exactly try to be good at everything. Maybe I'm just overthinking it, and I do still really like this episode, but I can't help mourning lost potential, you know? You're Fryman! Look at your hair! What about my hair? Kiki is standing over here when this scene starts, but then, as if inheriting this power from her father's greatest adversary, she seemingly teleports to behind the counter just to walk away from it again? Do you know how many metal concerts I've missed because of this war? How many? Mmm, like, one? Ronaldo! Hmm? Kiki! Hmm? You're sitting next to each other. Oh god no, Steven's matchmaking again. I'm getting war flashbacks. Okay, you don't have to pretend to get married, just pretend to be in love long enough to get this feud over with. I got a bad feeling about this. Shut up, Ronaldo! Ugh. I was joking about the whole new Lars thing, but now they're just flat out disregarding Ronaldo's feelings for the sake of their dumb plan. I know it's being played more for laughs here and is nowhere near as serious as that episode, but it still makes me the tiniest bit uncomfortable. Are you telling me that you two are involved in a romantic relationship? I come all this way to return your koala princess DVDs, only to find you with another girl. Okay, this is clever. I like that the Crooniverse actually gave Ronaldo a girlfriend. It sends a nice message that anyone can find love. Save it for your blog. Keep Beach City safe. Single. But on the other hand, that line sucks balls. You know where Suitcase Sands is? It used to be a restaurant called the Everything Buffet, but it wrecked the boardwalk's economy. But just when everyone thought all hope was lost, our dad and Fryman teamed up and ran them out of town. There's a lot I can suspend my disbelief about in this show, and you know that most of the time I'm even aware that a ton of my points are just nitpicks. But you cannot tell me that two shops that only really sell pizza and fries were able to compete with and even take down a corporation that sells everything. That's like saying my local pizza place and diner that sells fries could team up to take down Walmart. That's ridiculous. I will have the fantastic fries. I will have the pizza bagel. Oh, come on. They have the hyperbolic wowing adjective on the fries, but just call the pizza on a bagel a pizza bagel? I can see which food they have more faith in. I like the little touch in this shot that Kofi is literally the only one freaking out here, and these two are like, yeah, just another Tuesday. Look at how small Steven is here! He's so small that in the next shot, which I assume is from his perspective, Fryman's hands are so big they look swollen! I would think that even without model sheets, they'd at least make Steven's height distinguishable from a literal toddler. Do you hear that, Ronaldo? The war is over! <laughs> Y'all help me clean this place up. Sorry, we on break. You know, why did the gems even participate in this to begin with? Maybe they think it's amusing, or perhaps Garnet convinced them in some way. But surely at least Pearl would see this as idiotic and want no parts of it, right? What's this? You want me to close my lovely establishment? Better ingredients, better pizza, better bitches, better money, my clothes better, my shoes better, I, I work harder. Little Caesars, fuck Domino's. I'm taking some me time. You want in? I would think that would destroy the point of me time. See ya! <sighs> they hung on that shot for a lot longer than they needed to. Kinda awkward. Pizza time! Ah! Pulling on her leg at this point doesn't really seem like a good idea because if this clearly strong pizza hand keeps a tight enough grip, let's just say that a lot of red stuff will be spilled and it certainly won't be ketchup. Anything is possible when you have rockets for bones! 
Anything except Kiki being able to escape, apparently. Actually, with that in mind, how does Steven's dream hopping work, anyway? It's clear from Steven doing that and also being able to control stuff that he's lucid dreaming in someone else's dream. So does that not apply to Kiki? Is she not lucid somehow? Because considering how this dream has worked so far, and dream experts can correct me if I'm wrong on this, shouldn't Kiki also be lucid if she can willingly control her emotions and some of her actions during the dream? If so, couldn't she just free herself? Or because this is more like a nightmare, is that not possible? I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this one, because I'm genuinely not sure. Steven's walking is animated in such a way that it looks more like he's limping instead of walking normally. Kiki puts both of her hands on Steven's shoulders in this shot, but in the next shot she only has one hand on his shoulder, then after that it's back to two. Also, the way her apron is positioned here changes between these two shots. In the first shot it seems to go around her shoulders, then in the next shot it goes around her neck. In your dreams! <laughs> nice! No, no it wasn't. Time to cut the cheese! Prepare yourself for my greatest technique yet! Dream warrior! Dream warrior! How does Steven get exhausted from using his power like this? I know it's probably some magic BS, but it's not like his brain or his body are doing anything different when dream hopping. He's technically still sleeping, and your brain is always active when you're dreaming, so it can't really be that. And even when you lucid dream constantly, the quality of your sleep isn't actually affected. So unless this is making Steven constantly wake up in the middle of the night, which there's no indication of, there's next to no reason this should be making him as exhausted as he ends up being. And to add on to that, Steven wakes up at 3 p.m. here, which if we assume Kiki is working a usual 9 to 5, should mean Steven has gotten to catch up at least decently on sleep, right? Is he still worrying about helping Kiki and therefore it's still causing his brain to try to connect to Kiki's dream, causing the same effect? I don't know, this is just fucking confusing, and I'm sure overthinking it to fill my nitpicking quota isn't helping. I don't know, Kiki, I think you do! I'm sorry, I... I didn't mean to yell. No, it's okay. I've been asking too much of you. I know it's small, but after the new Lars attacked my enjoyment of this show, I've come to appreciate moments like this where Steven recognizes he's lost his cool and apologizes for it. Bonus points for Kiki actually being a good role model and not immediately firing back, but instead staying calm and admitting her faults as well. We've just been looking at the toppings of the problem. We've got to track this back to the sauce. And now he isn't tired anymore? Is it because he views today's mission with more importance and so pushes it aside unnaturally well? I don't buy that. I do really love the creativity of this place though. It's nice that they put a bit of thought into stuff that would live in a pizza ocean kind of environment. The straps on Kiki's shirt disappear in this shot. And that's especially sinful considering that if I just show you this screenshot out of context, this doesn't exactly look like it's for kids. When I said I couldn't help you anymore after this, you understood. But this is different. She's my sister. That's right. And she cares about you too. Do you think she'd want to put you through this? Does she even know this is happening to you? No. You gotta tell her. This is done pretty masterfully in my opinion. Don't let others push you around is one of the more common morals out there. But the added layer of it being from someone you care about makes this one stand out a little more. And it's great how well they handle it. I hate to be a broken record here, but it really is a night and day difference between this and the new Lars, and it makes me wonder what the hell happened there. But on the other hand, I would think that this likely wouldn't go down that easily, right? I know they were probably running out of time, but I think this would have benefited by having Jenny argue about this a little with her, so that Kiki would have had to explain her reasoning some more. This is still a great scene, I just think it could have been even better. I think you have a serious problem with pizza. I'm sorry, I don't speak watermelon. MC Bear Bear, you've got a tear tear. This is an MC Bear Bear. This is Master of Ceremonies Bear Bear, which was introduced in Future Vision. This is MC Bear Bear, which was introduced in Mirror Gem. Why they made two different bears with the same acronym is beyond me. 
funny how Steven's healing spit has been MIA for literally a season and a half, only for it to come back now to conveniently serve this kind of plot. I mentioned it once and I'll do it again. Why would you introduce a character's power only to immediately drop it? Look what I can do! With my future vision, I can see you're going to ask if you could use your power to heal one of the monsters in the bubble room. Well, good thing Steven wasn't gonna ask you if you wanted to go get food or something, cause you'd sure look like a fucking idiot right about now, wouldn't you? Future vision in general is dumb, but using it to try to predict one question out of millions someone can ask you is very ambitious, to say the least. Why did you agree to this? I lost the battle of will. Ow, you couldn't have done that any gentler? How do you hear and look at that and go, ah yes, this gem is no longer corrupted, my plan was flawless. It's an improvement, sure, but to say it worked is also rather ambitious. Pearl isn't even looking at Steven as she talks here, she's just staring off into space. I try not to bring it up much because the same critique gets old after a while, but this is just one of the several examples of this episode's art direction being weird again. She can walk and talk, just like you guys. Walk, sure, but talk? I didn't know Steven spoke Klingon. You don't remember saving me from that seagull or our adventure in the ice caves or when I electrocuted you with, uh, actually, do forget that one. I love chips. <laughs> do you remember me singing the chaps jingle? Not necessarily. She could have just been repeating the jingle you just sang. This turns out to be a whole different language that Gems used, which is honestly another neat detail that the Kroonoverse went the extra mile for. However, Nephrite's hands are black in this shot instead of brown, a detail that the Kroonoverse sure didn't go that extra mile for. This is actually Hessonite from Save the Light. That's pretty damn cool. You heard something from the sky, a, a sound, a song, and then... <laughs> Senti? I really like this sequence. It's not exactly an original way to get lore from something you can't understand, but the story itself is really impactful. If there's anything Steven Universe did really well earlier on, it's building the lore up. Why is this only temporary? Did this only stave off the corruption and thus it's spreading again? Because that's really not how healing things works. And even then, that can't be because when he tries it again, it seemingly stops working. What the fuck's making it stop working then? And if your counter argument to that is Steven's healing power is not working very well on mental ailments, then why did this even start to work in the first place? And if anything, this could lead into another aspect of the critique of how corrupted gems work as a whole. Some of it seems so random. Nephrite somehow turns into this thing. This guy somehow turns into a wind-blowing pufferfish. How does all this shit work? Corruption as a concept is cool, but the way it works desperately needed exploring. It leaves all these unanswered questions that make scenes like this come out of nowhere and make little sense. This turns out to be Nephrite's ship, which is another really good bit of world building we've seen earlier on. However, a hole was actually blown into the ceiling of this ship, which appears to be missing here. The size of this door changes a couple times in between shots. In this shot, it comes up to about the centipedal's top beak thing, then it shrinks to below her mouth, then it's bigger than her. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Watch the four letters, Stewball! And now it's time for Silly Songs with Laddie, the part of the show where Laddie comes out and sings a silly song. Steven has these really odd looking light blue shorts for this episode only, and it doesn't look that great on him at all. Also, this shot specifically makes them look like pants for some reason. I may be rich, but buying a boat would be going a bit overboard. Lapis Lazuli, nice to meet you. Great! I know you spent a really long time fused with Jasper at the bottom of the ocean, but you're not Malachite anymore, and water is a part of who you are. Yeesh, aren't we stereotyping Lapis just a bit? And why are you forcing her to do something that you want her to do, disregarding her feelings almost entirely? I thought the Crystal Gems whole shtick was going against what they were made to do and forging their own path, not sticking to what one person is coaxing them to do. We even named her Lil Lappy. 
In this shot, when Steven blinks, his eyelid isn't colored at all. Also, Lapis's mouth disappears in this frame. Finally get enough of that horn? What? I still like this gag, but the fact that Steven has this hearing problem for a grand total of two seconds before dropping it entirely is very strange writing. And there it is. You caught yourself a fish to eat. Something tells me that Steven would not be okay with eating an innocent fish. In Island Adventure, when eating fish was necessary to survive, he felt really, really shitty about it. So what changed, especially since he doesn't exactly need it to survive right now? Put something on it you know it wants, like a worm or a $20 bill. Why specifically a $20 bill? I'm pretty sure fish don't exactly understand the concept of an economy. Maybe I'm reading too far into a joke, but I feel like Greg wouldn't be this frivolous with his money even if he is rich. And so this joke is kind of forsaking that. Fishing! But the company you catch. Whoa! Okay, several things here. First of all, there is nothing in the water here that grabs this hook, even though we can clearly see any silhouettes that are close to the surface of the water. That's pretty weird. Secondly, Jasper stays surprisingly still when she does grab this hook, and also doesn't start yanking on it until a bit after she grabs it. Why doesn't she just immediately try to pull herself up? What, is she so enamored by the quality and pure lustrousness of the hook that she stares at it like Ganondorf or something? Thirdly, why exactly does Jasper have to board the ship via this fishing hook? It's shown later that she is perfectly capable of attacking the boat in order to board it, so why even bother doing this? Plus, by sinking the ship, she also harms or potentially kills who she thinks is Rose Quartz. So it's literally a win-win for her and she just doesn't take it. The line of the fishing rod snaps in this shot, but somehow in this shot it shows that the rod itself snapped too. How did that happen? Also, Lapis's gem is missing in this shot. And then, after coming back in this shot, it instead looks like a children's sticker. It's mostly advice on sun tanning and what crackers go with caviar. What crackers go with caviar? Water crackers. That's not it. I, I miss her. <laughs> What? We refused for so long. I really, really like how this episode expands on the concept of fusions as a form of relationship. We've seen a whole spectrum of different fusions and what they represent, and we're going to continue to see even more. But this one is unique in that it represents an abusive relationship. That combined with how clearly traumatized Lapis is, and how quick she is to blame herself for different things that being Malachite made her think was her fault alone, then add on that Jasper in this episode is written to be similar to a part that gaslights someone into thinking they've changed, only to try to drag them right back into the same shitty situation, I'd honestly go so far as to say this is masterfully handled. And it's one of this season's high points, in my opinion. However, throughout the entirety of this scene, the bottom part of Jasper's gem continuously changes colors from orange to purple. Some of it could maybe be chalked up to shading, but it happens no matter where she looks, so I'm just gonna call it a color error. This is between us! Wow, that shield sure did a lot of good. Why didn't he put up a bubble? In this situation, I think that would have been a lot more effective. I'll shatter you! Either Jasper's the slowest runner in the world, or they made that scene artificially long. Because there's no way Jasper didn't reach Steven when she had that much time. What happened? What the hell do you mean, what happened? How do you not see or hear any of that? This is between us! <laughs> the first chance you had to drop this gig, you tried to hand it off to Goku. Goku! He doesn't even look after his own kid! I look after his kid more than he does! get this job. It's a wonder this hasn't come up once until now. It's also a wonder that Greg didn't just say I needed to start being independent so I started working here to make money and leave it at that. You look at everything you are. I really like this song. It does a good job describing Greg's situation with Rose and needing to balance her and his basic necessities. I also think it's really interesting how this show handles Vidalia being a single mom and having to deal with the fallout of Marty pretty much ditching her. It's a really unique angle to the whole single parent storyline that a lot of shows like to go for. 
However, I'm going to bring this up now since doing it later might be a bit awkward. Vidalia looks really inconsistent in terms of age. In this episode, she looks to be in her late teens, early 20s, and Sour Cream looks like he's a little less than a year old. Then later, in Three Gems and a Baby, we see this picture where Sour Cream looks like he's about 8 or 9, while Vidalia looks maybe a little bit older. She would be about her late 20s at least. So she seems to be aging relatively gracefully considering the hand she'd been dealt up to that point. Three Gems and a Baby also has to be 14 years before the middle of season 4, since Steven is only a few months old there. But then Onion Friend, which takes place about 13 or 14 years later, has her looking like this. How the hell did she age that much in 14 years? She looks like she's in her mid-50s. You could say that the stress of being a single parent for so long really had an effect on her, but in this picture, she looks relatively okay after Sour Cream is already 8 or 9. So did having and raising Onion have that that much of an impact on her? Because even then, I don't think it would leave her looking 10 years older than she actually is. But hey, this is coming from Mr. Doesn't Wanna Have a Kid, so what do I know? That spoon looks entirely too big for him. I've been working on some songs for my new album. Oh, the same new album you've been working on for six months? I would think that after being around people like Marty and Greg, Vidalia would understand that albums take a little time to make, right? Maybe she knows Greg enough to know he'd slack off on it, but even then, six months would still require a lot of crunch to be able to get a full album done in that time. Especially since Greg probably works alone with only the very occasional help from Rose. Baby sour cream meets sunscreen. Firstly, you just wiped most of that on his shirt. How is that supposed to help? At least put it on his face. Secondly, why are you even bothering putting sunscreen on him when he's mostly gonna be in the shade anyway? Neither him or Rose plan on moving him, so what was the point? Especially since the FDA says that putting sunscreen on an infant is actually dangerous for them. This is sour cream. Did you make him? <laughs> what? <laughs> The shading on Sour Cream is all wrong here. He's still colored like he's in the shade. Meanwhile, Greg is shaded just fine. Not to mention, Sour Cream is literally copied and pasted from this previous shot where he is fully in the shade, before either him or the shade itself just teleports. Greg and Rose are pretty drenched in this shot, and then in the very next shot, they're instantly dry. Greg's hair is suddenly huge in this shot. You're both human. You have to admit it's a little confusing. You're big and can talk and he's small and can only make noises. How was I supposed to know you were the same species? That same thing can literally apply to gems though. Gems come in all shapes and sizes and their ability to do things can vary wildly. I get Rose and by extension Pink Diamond still doesn't know everything about humans, but I think that after this long on the planet, she'd have gotten the memo by now. Sour Cream looks like this when Greg leaves in this shot, but then in the next shot, his limbs shrink. What were you saying? How long was he gone? The temple is literally right around the corner from where they are on the beach. He cannot use the warp pad, and Rose never picked Sour Cream up and took him anywhere. So how did they not only get all the way to Funland, but how did Sour Cream climb up a fucking Ferris wheel with limbs like these? It is literally not possible unless she helped him, which she clearly states she didn't. Also, I get Greg is a little naive, but he isn't stupid. Why do they have him look up in the sky and inside a video game? There's making a funny, and then there's making a character look like a complete uncaring idiot. Going a little too fast. Hold on, sour cream. <laughs> Leave Greg alone. How? Messing with that lever should have moved it between stopping and starting, breaking it shouldn't have made it go faster, and destroying it certainly shouldn't make it go faster than us mere mortals can comprehend. But I'm not a baby! I don't need someone to save me when I climb onto a ferris wheel and- If not being able to save yourself from being stuck on a ferris wheel while also holding an infant counts as being a baby, then fuck, in comparison, we're all still fetuses. You want it back, or are you just gonna go for a topless stroll? We all gotta grow up sometime, right? Why would he not take his shirt back? Being independent does not mean you reject that kind of help entirely. Whatever happened to baby sour cream? You literally know him. Why would you ask that? Vidalia's gonna destroy me! Well, this sucks.
Garnet sensed some corrupted gem activity in these woods. She sensed it? What? How the hell did she do that? Is she a Jedi? Can gems sense each other like Lapis did in Ocean Gem? And if so, then how come it's used so sparingly? Why does Steven never learn it? This just comes right out of nowhere. Also, in this shot, Steven doesn't have a phone in his hands. Then in the next shot, it just suddenly materializes into them. And no, he did not have enough time to reach into his pocket and grab it. What good is that tiny baby shield going to do against a giant corrupted gem? We've seen that Steven can make it any size imaginable, so why did he make it so small? Granted, making it bigger might cost him some stamina, but surely making it even the size of his arm would be better, right? What was the point of the corrupted gems even approaching the group if they were just gonna run off somewhere else anyway? There weren't supposed to be two. So wait, Garnet only sensed one? So are these sensing powers limited? Was Garnet just lazy? And if this were an instance of her using future vision, you'd think they would just say it outright. And honestly, it would make a lot more sense here than just she sensed it. Plus, it would let her see the possibility of there being two of them here and thus prep the group accordingly. This sensing shit only seems to be there to add artificial tension. I've read this book front to back at least 20 times. Yeah, because one book is gonna give you all the material you need to help survive in the cold, harsh wilderness. But as soon as you find the monster, contact me immediately. I don't want you fighting this thing alone. How the fuck is she even going to know where they are? What, can she sense Steven? Because A, that's dumb. And B, there's no guarantee she'll even make it there in time. And honestly, this whole split up and find it situation seems like a really stupid idea for Connie's first mission. She has the training, sure, but Pearl of all people should know that training has nothing on experience. And someone's first experience is going to be a shock to them. They need guidance. Pearl not not being there is just a disaster waiting to happen. Why don't they just focus on one at a time so they can all go together and have the best chance of success? What could be even a remotely good benefit of trying to get them both at once? I doubt they're gonna hurt anyone out here. I'm getting the impression that Pearl is being a bit too lax here, which I guess is what they were going for. But in the face of obvious danger, I'd think Pearl would reconsider. And who's your favorite gem? Pearl! Why, thank you. Yeah. These are fresh. Of course they're fresh. You literally just saw them run this way. You're a wilderness expert. No, she's not. That's common fucking sense. Look at how suddenly he stops. That's animated so weirdly. Also, in the next shot, Steven somehow ends up in the snow pile when he was just next to it in the previous shot. We can definitely take care of this ourselves. Oh, you sound very confident. Carry on, then. I get Pearl has had Connie under her tutelage for a while now. And I'm even gonna give her the benefit of the doubt here and say she's taught Steven some things about survival as well. But if Pearl, a gem very experienced in missions, is having trouble following a corrupted gem's tracks and finding it, why does she think that these two amateur children will do any better? And again, I know she's trying to trust the kids more, but I think she should be a bit more cautious than she is right now. I assume that this area is supposed to indicate some kind of struggle between Jasper and the Corrupted Gem, right? But this doesn't really look like a fight broke out here at all. If it had, there would probably be a few skid marks here and there, maybe some marks to indicate one of them falling over, and a bit more destruction than just one or two falling trees. Instead, this just looks like they met up and had a nice dance together. We should probably take shelter from this blizzard. This is a blizzard? If this is a blizzard, I'd hate to see what your reaction to a hurricane would be. Let's grab some of these pine needles. We can brew a vitamin C rich tea with them so we don't get scurvy. Are we not going to check and make sure this is the one pine tree out of the more than 120 different kinds there are that can make this tea? And that's not even taking into account that you need to pick these pine needles off of trees to make the tea, not off the ground. This is why you don't get your survival intel from a book. I think Connie would know this. This weather has really taken a turn for the worst. It is such a tiny amount of snow. Is it supposed to be a blizzard and they just didn't know how to animate it? I really doubt that. So what's the deal? Also, why aren't they just responding and saying they found the monster? Connie literally looks over and sees the gem noticing them. So why not just call for help at this point? Let me try talking to it. You can pull out your shield and talk to it at the same time. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. There's no guarantee talking to it will work, so don't take the risk. Is this because of the favorite gem thing? That was just a joke. Don't tell Garnet. Look what I got. You were supposed to call me, and you did. This was a total success. That's major copium. How can you call failing to secure the two corrupted gems and having them both in the hands of your enemy a success? 
Steven took this picture from inside his bubble, but the picture is in tinted pink somehow. The tea is ready. Here, try it. Thanks. Disclaimer. The following is a parody of Cinema Sins Everything Wrong With series. If you're unfamiliar with their humor, I suggest you go watch their content first. With this in mind, everything in this video is absolutely seriously serious criticism towards Steven Universe, and should be taken 100% seriously through all forms of seriousness. Seriously. So the Kroonerverse decided to flip this entire episode, and only this episode for some reason. They said in an interview that it was because of the calendar, whatever the hell that means. So it looks like we're watching Nuvets S Revenue Rakus Akaber de Taurk Eb today. Wait, this is supposed to be Crack the Whip, they couldn't even get the right title card for this? This hand is wrong, five sins. But, but Amethyst is a weeb. Why does Connie just have a random purple dog in this scene? There's literally no build-up to this. Also, this same red kangaroo doesn't even talk, so much for the show being magical. Also, also, what the hell is this symbol on the sword? It looks like a capital A in a pink circle, in a giant saw, in a white circle, in a rectangle covering a sword. Maybe it belongs to White Diamond, who knows? A does stand for diamond, after all. Are you headed back north? No, Connie. Everybody knows that according to the lore, all gems must fly back south for the winter. Fuck, even Steven knows that, and last I checked, he can't even fly. We can't have her just out there attacking random monsters for whatever reason. Pearl hates the Monster Hunter franchise. This scene does not contain a lap dance. Inflation! Daddy, I don't want to be on Namek anymore. Steven's a Gary Stew. Hey, Amethyst, did you see that? Steven, Amethyst is blind. We learned that in Jailbreak when she was trying to find her long-lost lover, Peridot. Come on, Crooniverse, keep your lore straight. Also, how could the Crooniverse let this awful animation error slip? It's so obvious that my media player, VLC, catches it constantly without my consent. I don't even want to imagine where those fingers are going. Oh fuck, I was too horny to notice that the magenta lizard died. Too bad the Crooniverse put all their budget into flipping the episode. We need money for the funeral. Quick, one like equals one dollar towards a new cyan giraffe. The water behind Lapis here is blue, when I'm pretty sure water is supposed to be purple. I blew it on my first real magical mission. I wish we got to see that instead of getting that episode where Steven invested in the stock market. Sure, he did it with watermelons, but that still wasn't very educational. What you gotta be is loose. I wanna be loose! Steven and his slow descent into becoming a bottom. And the hamster's still dead! Fighting's all about that feeling deep in your guts. So Vor, got it. I don't know why you're hungry. You got a nice ripe skunk over there to eat. Mm -hmm, like a burger. But this is a donut shop. Aw oh, man, why did the Crooniverse redesign the cookie cats to look like lizards? I loved their old designs. Also, there's a very hidden continuity error here that I wouldn't put it past you to miss. It's very obscure. You see, in this scene, Lars' skin is fucking purple for some reason. Her skin color, just in case you don't happen to remember this very small detail, is colored like skin. So much for the Crooniverse being all about small details. Also, they made Lars transgender in this scene as well, showing the Crooniverse's true colors as woke radical left extremists. Now you're gonna tell me she's gay for Sadie or something. Just Amethyst be an Amethyst. No, that's Ronaldo. Where the hell's the dialogue? The last thing I want to hear in my... S the last thing I want to hear in my Steven Universe is some dumb, stupid, modern com commentary. The last thing I want to hear in my Steven Universe is some dumb, stupid, modern contemporary rap written by virgins in their mother's basement. P.O.B., you're my last... Who the hell is that?! Oh hey, they got a new gerbil! Oh hey, they got a new gerbil! Oh hey, they got an- I'm going to eat you. Hot. 
Garnet isn't promoting safe Ferris wheel usage here. Didn't they learn anything from the hit season 1A episode, Serious Sapphire? And hell, in a later episode, they do even worse by having Yellow Diamond break a Ferris wheel entirely trying to save Uncle Yellowtail from falling. See, the water's purple here. That earlier scene had no excuse. Wow, that's a huge catfish. Major Dewey's an asshole to Cherson. I remember you too, buddy. <laughs> I have no earthly idea why the Crooniverse, in later releases of this episode, decided to include the detail of this kid pissing himself a little here. Nora would never do that. Crystal gems are back, and we'll give those diamonds another taste of what's coming. Now show me what you got, soldiers. This was the best part of Steven vs. Amethyst. Subtract three sins. Rose. No, that's suitcase Sam. I'm gonna whip your butt. Oh. You think you can just keep showing up and Oh, sorry about that. YouTube wouldn't like it if I let Garnet say what Aquamarine does every time she comes here. Fucking is my life! Whoops, can't let that one through either. Orange Sonic the Hedgehog is canon and would like to have a word with you. Oh, for fuck's sake, the pink seal died again. You two need to get a better pet. This one's defective. It can't even talk. Its voice actor's lazy as fuck. You're Gonna have to censor this too. I'm pretty sure Aquamarine can't pound Garnet on television. Rose said, I'm perfect the way I am. And she had low standards. <laughs> you could have been me. She is you, though. You're both cartoon characters. And what are you instead? A cartoon character. Jasper used headbutt. It's super effective. <laughs> Suddenly sex. Also, this song sucks. Never gonna give you up by Rick Astley is better. You fused? No, Aquamarine. They gave birth. Big difference there. Oh, never mind. The dragon's fine. Feet. Jaspers, keep going until we get what we want. Oddly enough, that's her last appearance. It's such a shame they couldn't afford to pay the royalties for Aquamarine to come back. Also, why are there triangles in the water? I thought triangles weren't invented until Warp Tour when we were introduced to the best gem, Hessonite. I guess she lives in the ocean now. No, she lives in Tennessee. Get it right. You didn't need me at all. Why does Garnet feel alone here? Isn't she like three lesbians or something? What the fuck? Hello? Actually, they're roommates. Oh my god. Also, can I get a shout out? Leave me alone! Oh, I completely forgot. Pearl's voice should be muffled here. In this shot, Connie is next to Lion and behind Steven. But in the next shot, she's moved up next to Steven and in front of Lion. Lion is supposed to be looking at Amethyst here, but instead it just looks like he's looking at where she was standing before she came up next to them. Hey, no fair! You dodged my clearly telegraphed deflect that would have very clearly heard and maybe even cut something at worst! How dare you! <laughs> ah yes, this is peak training. Connie smacking Steven's shield over and over again with no technique, no change in strategy to break past it, her stance isn't even correct, what the hell is this? Starting with this shot, the animation takes a really sharp nosedive, and this shot is actually the perfect way to show how. There are several things that are really wacky about it. First of all, look at Amethyst's arm here. Ouch. Secondly, what kind of awkward direction is Connie's head turned in right now? In the next shot, we see that Connie is actually turned to the side and that her head is turned to face Amethyst. But here, she walks towards Amethyst in roughly the same position, meaning she's either walking sideways or backwards depending on how this shot is animated. Thirdly, Connie's nose looks like it's on her forehead. 
Looking at what's available behind the counter here, why is the milk that this place sells only behind the counter? Why not put some in one of the fridges over to the right to make it more accessible to the customer? Also, where did Amethyst get these bags from? There weren't any behind the counter in the previous shots. Also, also, despite Amethyst taking possibly dozens of donuts, and also having stolen several sodas as well, Steven only sees it fit to give Sadie $1 bills and Connie only gives coins. Maybe Steven and Connie weren't prepared to have to cover this? But then why animate them giving Sadie this small amount of money in the first place? How? Not only should this gem have surfaced a while ago, who knows how long it was waiting under there for, but even if it did make sense for it to be underwater, how did nobody notice until now? Did it really stay so still that the water wasn't unnaturally affected at all? Also, I assume Jasper is still making her way over here. So then why did she let this one go ahead by itself? What if it ran off? Did she think it would be loyal to her somehow, despite it being scared of her and essentially being a wild animal while corrupted? What's the logic here? What was the plan? In this shot, the gem's back legs look pretty normal. They're about the size you'd expect. Then suddenly in this shot, the ends of them get way skinnier. There were two of them. Two of them? Did Pearl and Garnet just not tell Amethyst all the details of what happened in the Great North? Why? You'd think they would want to keep everyone on the same page in a situation as important as this. So wait, Jasper is here, but then where are Garnet and Pearl? I'd assume that since Garnet was tagging along, they'd have at least some idea where she was and where she's going. Surely they weren't just running off somewhere blindly. It really says something when this is another instance where Garnet using future vision could have really helped the plot here. Because if she did, then Garnet would have had an idea that this would happen and had her and Pearl come back. And considering that Jasper's in the ocean where her movement speed, and by extension the amount of places she can go, is very limited, then surely she wouldn't have been able to go anywhere very quickly and thus would cut down on the possibilities future vision has right imagine how cool it would have been if garnet and pearl came back and all of the crystal gems and stevani fought jasper and it still could have tied into amethyst's feeling of inadequacy by having her lag behind and almost getting herself poofed before having to be saved somehow but with what we got instead pearl and garnet being mia for this episode feels not only forced but completely preventable if the chronoverse just used their characters powers more Rose said, I'm perfect the way I am. Then she had low standards. That's such a good raw line. I think that deserves a sin taken off on its own. However, the stripes that are on Jasper's face disappear in this shot. What the fuck is the corrupted gem doing here? Oh gee, an emotional moment is happening. I gotta give these two some space to watch it happen. Also, what is Connie's spine doing? Oh gee, an emotional moment is happening. I gotta just bend really awkwardly real quick. This entire sequence from this point onwards is absolutely golden in my opinion, and probably one of the best scenes this season. The sequence itself is really high stakes and energetic, with a fight that's engaging despite its simplicity. And the music is amazing. It's a shame I can't really play it, but it's called I'll Protect You. Look it up, it's great stuff. This scene alone makes the entire episode worth watching to me. It's that damn good. Amethyst Gem disappears from Stevani's hand in this shot. Wait here, I'll protect you. Her gem seems very vulnerable to being stepped on here. She's literally right in front of Lion. They couldn't have at least put her down two feet further to the side? <laughs> Why would she just stand there and do nothing in that situation? Oh hey, you want me to hold this shield for you? Sure, what exactly are you gonna do while I- Oh my god! Hmm, I guess she lives in the ocean now. What you gotta be is loose. Let's get ready to rumble! Wow! <laughs> We're never going to find Jasper. Hate to be a broken record here, but I really find it hard to believe that Garnet didn't even try to use future vision once while they were out. We found Jasper! You didn't really find her. She found you, if anything. You wanna come watch me train? Can't. I'm busy making egg salad. Also, why does Pearl need a fanny pack? She has a gem that can store literally anything. 
Last week, I got these. There is no way those things fit in the pearl prize pouch. Dodge the fears the best you can. I am 99% certain that Steven just cheated. This exercise is meant to test agility, not blocking. That's just blatantly unfair against Amethyst, who has no way to reliably block things. And the fact that he won because of it is honestly ridiculous. Whoa. Whoa, he used that weapon he's used dozens of times. That's so impressive. Don't go too easy on him. He still needs a challenge. How can Pearl not tell how upset Amethyst is here? Look at her face. It's not exactly subtle. The hollow pearls are thrown in all directions here, but then in the next shot, they conveniently line up next to each other. Also, look at how lightly this shield taps these hollow pearls, and yet they still die. I know Pearl's going easy on Steven, but come on, this is going a little too far. Look at this. Steven looks over at Amethyst, his face drops, he clearly looks concerned. But somehow, Pearl either doesn't notice or doesn't care. Pearl is a lot smarter and better at picking up emotions than this. Why are they writing her to be so oblivious? How did that fit in the pouch? At this point, it would have made infinitely more sense if she just used her gem. This must be an absolute garbage heap of a fighting game if it's on the GameCube and it only has five characters in it. Even if there are unlockable characters, that's still pitiful. What great video game playing, spamming the B button and left on the D-pad. That was crazy good, Amethyst. Nice job. God, you couldn't have at least tried to make that bit of praise not sound fake. This controller's logo says Dolphin in this shot, but then in this shot, it says Sumi. You have two whips. Two whips! Can't everyone on the team summon infinite copies of their weapon? Hell, Steven summons two shields in the previous episode. It's not exactly unique. I'll prove it! I'll, I'll fight you! Where the fuck did that come from? This declaration is so random and out of left field that it kind of derails this whole scene in my eyes. Think about it. Instead of having Steven do what he does best and talk Amethyst down from these toxic thoughts, his first instinct after hearing all this is to fight her? That sounds a bit out of character for him. And it gives this episode a think of a concept first and write the whole episode around it vibe that does not fit the rest of the show at all. Seriously, the writing for this episode episode feels like they started with Steven and Amethyst fight scene and went from there. It's so jarring. And it's especially egregious when you remember that Pearl was specifically written in a way that made her both actively ignore Amethyst's feelings and not get involved in any way just so that it could escalate to this point. It all just feels wrong, and it's a significant step down in writing quality compared to last episode. Don't get me wrong, I like Amethyst's arc here and I think Amethyst herself is handled really well. It just feels like Steven Steven and Pearl were written to be very unlike themselves just to serve a plot that wouldn't have happened otherwise. That thing was huge. How is there so little rubble here? Don't stay also, if that shield was sharp enough to cut through a solid rock pillar, then how did it not cut Amethyst's head open? Maybe she's harder to cut than that rock and so it just banged against her head? But then wouldn't the pillar have done very little to her, thus making the gesture kind of pointless? See? I dropped you from the sky, but you almost just won using a rock! There is no chance in hell that would have poofed her, considering that Steven survived like eight of those things falling on top of him. He is a diamond, but he's only half diamond. I still don't think he'd be as durable. Also, the stars on Amethyst's knees are colored purple in this shot instead of being the same color as her shoes. <sighs> I can't even be the one thing I'm supposed to be, you know? Of course I do. I'm... Not Rose Quartz. Oh no. Oh, Steven. I really like this little scene. It just feels like a nice, kind of wholesome chat between two siblings that are really troubled in similar ways. It's stuff like this that makes these characters feel like real people more than just bundles of personality traits. You've ruined the ruins! They look almost completely the same. I think we're gonna see that prize pouch for a while.
So, in case you didn't happen to catch the thumbnail, this is my absolute favorite episode in all of Steven Universe. As such, while I'm going to try and continue to be as fair as possible, and my co-writer is going to help balance things out a little with his more neutral viewpoint on this episode, I'm letting you know now that I'm very biased in favor of this episode, and thus that may show at several points. So, let's begin. Lion, you can't chew this up. How else am I going to remember the time I rode the Thunderbird at Funland? If that shirt was so important to you, how was Lion able to grab it from up here without you noticing? If it was put somewhere else or you didn't notice it was gone from the spot where you put it, then clearly you don't care about it as much as you say you do. Now it'll be safe forever, hanging in this perfectly stable magic tree. <laughs> So they're finally addressing this gem inside Lion's Mane, which despite how much I love this episode, is still very strange timing. At this point, Steven's either completely ignored this gem inside Lion's Mane for almost two seasons, or he somehow didn't see it even once. Since the latter is highly unlikely, even I respect Steven's intelligence more than that, did he just never bring this up to the gems for some reason? How? Steven is a very inquisitive kid. I'm 99.9% .9 certain that the this would have come up at least once in passing, at the very least. A counterpoint to this might be that Steven just thought it was a corrupted gem, and so didn't really question it much. But A, I find it very hard to believe that Steven didn't at least ask the gems what something like that was doing in his fucking pet lion, and B, even if Steven somehow didn't ask them, you'd think he would at least want the bubble to be in the temple with the rest of them to heal them later. It's very surprising and honestly a little unrealistic that it took this long for this to happen. Jump! Jump! I am jumping! Not only are you not moving on screen, but you're not even pressing any buttons. How are you jumping? Also, where did Lion get this other shirt from? Steven's closet isn't open, his drawers are shut, and there weren't any other shirts lying around anywhere. I absolutely love this title card. Its uniqueness fits this episode so well. It pulls double duty and not only serving as an introduction to who this gem is, but also sets the tone perfectly with the mysterious and somewhat ominous music that plays in the background. It's so damn good. I also adore Bismuth's design here. The details help in giving you a basic rundown of certain aspects of her character. The stars throughout her body instantly communicate that she's a crystal gem. Her apron hints towards her role in the crystal gems and her interest in blacksmithery. It's these nice little details that make a great character design. Where the hell did she come from? She wasn't behind Steven and he looked around pretty thoroughly. I doubt she could really hide anywhere. I love Lion's face as Steven pulls Bismuth out here. He's just like, what the fuck did I eat? I also love this whole scene. The writing is pretty superb and feels like just a group of friends naturally talking together. Really great stuff. Rose said she lost track of you at the battle for the ziggurat. She was worried sick. If we consider that right now, Bismuth is coming right off the heels of a very heated argument with Rose that led to Rose literally stabbing her, it's strange how Bismuth is acting really damn level-headed here. When it comes to a harrowing experience such as being stabbed by your leader, you'd think Bismuth would be acting a little more frantic and focused on figuring out where Rose is and what she's doing. Maybe Bismuth got caught up in keeping up a calm appearance near the crystal gems, and I can kind of see that, but there should be at least some signs of stress, right? We get a more stressed expression on her face, but that appears slightly too late for it to be realistic. It only came up after Rose was not only mentioned, but also when Bismuth learned of the excuse she came up with. Shouldn't Bismuth at least have Rose somewhat on her mind at this point, at the very least? Also, this excuse doesn't hold up even slightly when you apply a little thinking to it, but Steven doesn't think to interject here. He literally found Bismuth inside of Lion's Mane. Why would Rose have put Bismuth there if she had just poofed in a regular battle? Why not put her in the temple? Why even bubble her in the first place? And yet Steven doesn't bring this up. The crystal gems seem entirely too quick to just accept Bismuth being back without questioning anything. And yeah, that may make a little sense for Pearl and Garnet who are just happy to have her back, but not only would Steven's hesitation for a good portion of this episode have warranted a little bit of thought towards this, but why do Pearl and Garnet not question why one of their best friends was in Rose's possession without either of them being told? Isn't Pearl super sensitive about all of Rose's secrets not being told to her? Why aren't any alarm bells going off here? 
It's not always easy to understand Rose's choices, but we have to stand behind them. Rose really is something else. I mean, look at this. She really is something else. Continuing on the trend of the gems being way too quick to accept things, why does Bismuth just believe the gems here? Look, I get it. Bismuth doesn't seem like the type to immediately think that what her friends say is bullshit. But again, she was stabbed by her fucking leader that she trusts. I would think her willingness to trust what other people say at face value would be a little worn by now. Especially with an explanation like, oh, Rose is someone else now, lol. Don't think about it too much. I know I'm being very harsh here towards my favorite episode, but it being my favorite doesn't mean I just ignore flaws like this, you know? Where is everybody else? Oh, Crazy Lace, Big Snowflake. Why are they taking her here? Wouldn't it be more effective to take her to the temple where the corrupted gems are and explain it to her? And it's not bad enough that they don't explain it, they actively word it terribly. Homeworld's final attack on Earth wiped out all of the crystal gems. No, they were not all wiped out. The ones Bismuth listed were corrupted. But instead of just telling her that, they instead lead her to believe they're dead. Which leads to a major misunderstanding in both this episode and season five that really shouldn't have happened. Why lie to her this extremely for no reason? Especially when she starts screaming about it and is generally very distressed. This feels like a writing oversight, which is odd for the Crewniverse. These little transitions are a really cute nod to anime. And it's a shame they don't do anything like this outside of this one episode. But then again, it makes this episode stand out even more, so who am I to complain? It feels like an oven in here. You think it's hot now? Yeah, like an oven. I could even learn how to love. Same joke twice? It'll be really funny if she does it a third time. That's really, really good foreshadowing. I also like this training session that the Crystal Gems do here. It's a nice sneak peek back to when the Gems had to prepare more for serious battles during wartime. I feel like this episode does a really good job in general of showing us another side to the Gems as a team that we don't get to see when things are super peaceful. It's a great change of pace. Come down and show me what you're made of! I would, but this is a little intense for me. This is intense, yet dual training with Connie and fighting Amethyst isn't? Also, one of the few things I like from Future is the Crooniverse expanding on Pearl and Bismuth's relationship. And I really appreciate them planting the seeds for that with little details like Pearl blushing throughout this episode. This is cursed. Also, Bismuth and Steven are chewing here, but there's no bite taken out of their pizza slices. With this demon blade, I will be the most powerful fighter in all the world! No, Lonely Blade, don't use it! If that thing's got infinite power, then of course Lonely Blade should use it. It just makes sense. More fantastic foreshadowing here. That's really cool. What the fuck happened to Bismuth's legs here? It's not time for the anime transition yet. Stop trying to be chibi. Everybody always tells me how great mom was. I just don't feel like I can ever measure up to her. You are different. That's what's so exciting. You don't have to be like Rose Quartz. You can be someone even better. You can be you. Scenes like this are what make this episode so special to me. It's so well written and almost perfectly describes Steven's struggles with trying to live up to his mother. The drama and emotional impact of this episode are so unique and powerful compared to the others. And we'll see much more of that later. And you know what? You deserve an even better weapon. But it is kind of stunted a tiny bit by this. You'd think that after, and I can't stress this enough, being stabbed by your leader, Bismuth wouldn't be so eager to stoke the same argument that caused her to be poofed in the first place. There's having your character be stubborn, and then there's having your character abandon all logic for drama's sake. Side note, I love this song coming up here. I can't play it, and it's about six minutes long, with most of it being atmospheric, but please give it a listen. It's called The Breaking Point. It's fantastic. It can cut through a gem's physical form in an instant, destroying the body, but never the gem. How exactly did she make it do that? What if there was just a poof gem on the floor and you tried to stab it? Would the sword just phase through it? Would it just smack against it or something? This sword is the main cornerstone and one of the biggest plot threads in this show. So you'd think they'd give it a little more explanation than just sword hit body, but not gem. We are the crystal. 
graphics aside, this thing looks really, really inefficient to actually try and use. Think about it. In order to use it properly, Bismuth has to be up close to her target. She has to aim it at a very specific part of a gem's body. Then it has to charge for at least a couple seconds. And then it has to hit their gemstone. The windup on it is so ungodly slow that there's nothing stopping a gem from either dodging it or counterattacking. Granted, it would combo decently with Rose's shield since she could block an attack while it charges up and that could give her an opening, but the aiming part kills it. Some gemstones are really small or hard to hit and it doesn't help that it gives a pretty clear tell of when it's going to fire. It just seems like a shitty and not great to use weapon all around. Now you look like you really mean bismuth. That's a genius payoff to the earlier joke with Amethyst. I adore the writing in this episode. Nobody's more crystal gem than I am. That's a fairly bold statement that seems a little bit out of character. I would get saying something like, I have more experience than you, so I'm more of a crystal gem than you. But saying she's more of a crystal gem than Pearl or Garnet? I don't know, I can't really picture Bismuth saying that. It is you, isn't it, Rose? You can't expect me to believe you now after you lied about everything? You're lying about this new form just like you lied to the others about me! But I didn't just disappear, did I? You know what happened to me! This part of the episode onwards, from here to the end, is probably my favorite part in all of Steven Universe. If not, then it's certainly high up there. The dialogue, the drama, the tension, the slow reveal that Rose may not be as perfect as everybody leads on. It's a about as close to perfect as you can get. I'm probably gonna be praising many things about this scene coming up, so get ready. How could you value the gems of our enemies more than our own? And look what you've done without me, without the breaking point. You've lost! Again, ethics aside, this is a genuinely great counter argument to Rose's strategy towards Homeworld, and in hindsight, it ages really well. In Bismuth's eyes, pacifism only caused the Crystal Gems to lose the war and most of their friends as a result, and in a way, it even put the whole planet in danger by not killing those who threatened its safety. But to Rose, and by extension Steven, lives being carelessly lost to revenge is a tragedy itself, and they want to avoid that as much as possible. It's a brilliant conflict of interest that pits two sides against each other, and I'd say both sides of the argument hold enough water for it to not be a simple black and white debate. This is how you write a moral dilemma, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what she did, but I'm sure she didn't want to hurt you. It's too late. I don't believe you anymore! And this response from Bismuth is completely understandable as well when you consider the position she's in. This is going exactly the same way as it did last time, almost eerily so. And while most may think rationally enough to realize that Rose's and Steven's ideals are just similar, when that same person was someone that, in your eyes, betrayed your trust and locked you away from all you held dear until most of them were gone, this is a situation where skepticism is very warranted. And I'm glad that the Crooniverse explored that this time rather than pushing those questions aside like earlier. It really enriches this plot thread in the long run. All that talk about how gems could take control of their own identities, how we've been convinced to ignore our own potential, that's all it was, wasn't it? Just talk! This part is awesome too. It explores how someone's mind can spiral when thinking through shit like this when really distressed. It makes your mind wander. It leads you to worrying about if anything else that person said was a lie. To the point where it can even lead to you questioning if their very ideals were just made up filth to begin with. Bismuth's entire purpose for living and joining the Crystal Gems was because of Rose's idea of letting gems have the freedom to do what they want to do. But by declining this weapon, it puts the idea in Bismuth's head that Rose values the lives of their enemies, enemies that will do away with the freedom of gems entirely, which Bismuth uses to justify shattering them. So with that logic, does Rose actually care about freedom? Because to Bismuth, valuing freedom seems to mean doing whatever it takes to protect said freedom. If you don't do that, then your heart isn't fully in it, and you've thus failed as a leader. Themes that are shown off now and expanded upon more later. I fucking love this scene. Though, what kind of face is Steven making here? This looks more like he's in awe at something in the sky more than he looks scared for his life. On the one hand, this plays completely perfectly to Steven's character. Attacking an opponent while simultaneously recognizing he doesn't want them to get seriously hurt, and thus shouting for them to move to minimize the damage done, that's just really cool. 
But on the other hand, how did Bismuth not hear that and then just jump out of the way? For a super powered gem, these guys sure dodge like ass sometimes. Bismuth. Why would you bring the breaking point to her? That's just begging for something bad to happen. You should have shattered me back then. At least if I were in pieces, I wouldn't have to know how little I mattered to you. You didn't even tell him. You bubbled me away and didn't ever tell your friends. My friends. I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them everything. <laughs> then you really are better than her. Before we get into this, I'm gonna put my one nitpick of this scene here. How was Bismuth able to talk to Steven for this long? Whenever someone else got poofed in this show, for example, when Pearl got poofed in Steven the Sword Fighter, she had nowhere near as long to say anything. This feels a little artificial for the sake of the drama, and it's a tiny bit jarring. But frankly, I don't care too much about that. This is my favorite moment in Steven Universe. This moment and its aftermath hit me really hard when I first watched this episode, to the point where it even had a stone-hearted little 14-year-old me almost in tears. It's just all so perfect. The emotional buildup and payoff is excellent, and it really helps that this is probably one of the most well-paced episodes in Steven Universe history. I know I'm really letting the nostalgia overtake me here when I say this, but this moment is one of the very few instances that takes me right back to when I watched this episode for the first time, and just how awestruck I was at the story being told. And call me biased all you want, but for being a moment this special and this effective at what it does, I think it's time I finally do this again. This episode 100% deserves it. Thank you, Kruniverse, for making this masterpiece of animation. Sometimes I wish I could be more than just an accessory to these women. But unfortunately, as a gamer, I don't get respect. Well, I'm not a gamer, so maybe they'll respect me. That just makes you a beta cuck. With how close Amethyst dragging that whip, it's a wonder she isn't tripping and falling. Also, Amethyst looks really squished in this shot. What's up with her legs? In this shot, the part of the truck behind Peridot looks like this. But in this shot, it changes to this other color. It confused me specifically because I'm pretty sure that part of the truck is supposed to be open for Peridot to crawl through here. But because it looks so strange, I thought she somehow crawled under a rear windshield or something. Something looks different about you. Have you grown taller since the last time I saw you? Nope. Still short. <laughs> You're welcome. For the joke. I see the lesson that Peridot learned in too far went in one ear and out the other, and frankly, I think that's bad writing. She saw how upset the idea of being short made Amethyst in too far, and she should even see it again here. But nope, she still jokes at Amethyst's expense and even laughs practically in her face. Couldn't they have at least tried to make Peridot express at least a little concern? Look at Amethyst's face. I'm pretty sure even the most emotionally inept person in the world could notice this. It sucks that they seem to basically undo Peridot's development just for the sake of this one joke. Lapis Biasin! No. This is the leaf Steven gave me. He reminds me of the time Steven gave me a leaf. Hey, yeah, it reminds me of that too. If this is a Camp Pining Heart VHS tape, where the hell did they put the tape in? Also, they stabbed the sides and bottom of this TV. That's gotta be a major electrical hazard. Is this one about the thousands of years you spent trapped in a mirror? No, I just really like that show. Her voice sounds entirely too nonchalant for what her face is communicating. Sounds like somebody didn't give the voice actor any direction. One, a two, a three, and... Well, that's as far as I practiced that. Lapis's gemstone is missing in this shot. 
Who has time for any of that when Jasper is out there? On the one hand, I kind of like this side of Amethyst that has a sense of urgency to get stuff done and take care of something that could be endangering the planet, even if it is selfishly placed. But on the other hand, where the fuck was this sense of urgency when the cluster was looming over everyone's heads and threatened to literally tear the planet apart? I get this conflict is a little more personal to Amethyst and thus she has more of a reason to want to get to work on it, but I would think that the Earth itself would be pretty damn urgent to Amethyst, especially since she's part of a group that made a pledge to protect the Earth. And honestly, Amethyst is a goddamn hypocrite in this scenario. Because wasn't it just last episode that the group were sitting around and watching Steven play a video game? Where was the grumpiness there? Where was the proclamation of, we're wasting time, we need to go find Jasper? Bismuth may have been placed weirdly and wasn't originally intended to be right before this episode, but that doesn't excuse how fucking weird this feels. Amethyst's outburst sort of rings hollow and she has a problem with taking a break now. Also, Lapis's hair looks way bigger than it should be in this shot. Big A. Big A. She's from the Beta Kindergarten in Facet 9. Have you seen that place? No? So have the Crystal Gems never actually gone there or ever mentioned it once at all? That's a pretty decently sized 4,000 year secret to keep, especially since then you'd have to neglect checking there to make sure there's nothing unpleasant happening. I want to check and make sure Lapis is okay. Hey, Lapis, are you okay? Lapis has this small part of her dress behind her leg in this shot, but then in this shot, it disappears. You know what to do with this. We're lucky this place hasn't blown away, Beta. Am I right? <laughs> That's a math joke, right? It really speaks to the Crooniverse's strengths that an episode that I've criticized this harshly is still making me chuckle this much. The way that this location is explored in general also shows another of the Crooniverse's strengths in world building. I'm genuinely interested to learn more about this place and its conditions during wartime as Peridot explains it. It's really fascinating stuff. The Crooniverse thrives in aspects such as world building and a character's development and emotional growth most of the time. It's just things like maintaining said characters while also cultivating new ones that seem to elude them sometimes. Look at this. The holes don't even line up. The holes in the prime kindergarten didn't exactly line up great either. I don't think that's quite as big a deal as you're making it out to be. None of these holes come close. What about that one? How did Peridot not see that? It's the biggest hole here. Also, what? How did Jasper come out this well in an environment this shitty? This seems like more than just luck. This is completely improbable. According to the wiki, kindergartens practically require rich resources in order to create even standard gems. So I find it incredibly hard to believe that creating someone like Jasper could have even been a pipe dream here. Also, also, why did she come out literally flexing? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's about who I want to be. Yeah. And I want to be the gem that beats Jasper into the dirt. Yeah. Huh? Wait, no. I'm doing it. And not just for me, for all the weird holes out there. Oh, God. Then what are they? How did Steven not see that thing? The hole's not that deep. Jasper. And now, how does Jasper not see or hear any of these three? I mean, fuck, even the corrupted gems are getting riled up just at their presence. Why is she not trying to find out what's happening? Oh, Amethyst, you'll love this one. Life and death and love and birth and Stop singing! This doesn't look very sturdy at all. The rocks are so cracked that they could probably give way any minute and this thing would be free. We should go back to the temple and grab reinforcements. That's a good idea. Amethyst? Honestly, what did you think was gonna happen? Stay out of this! You know, if Amethyst is adamant on fighting Jasper one-on-one, -on -one, what exactly is stopping either of these two from going to get help like Peridot suggested? I get Steven not doing it because he could potentially help shield Amethyst from stuff, but Peridot was the one that suggested the idea in the first place, and I'd hope she would realize that her trying to fight wouldn't really help things. Again, this could have led to something relatively interesting, like the Crystal Gems seeing Smoky Quartz and seeing their reactions, for example. But instead, Peridot just sees it fit to stand around doing absolutely nothing useful. So 
So, a couple critiques on Jasper's fighting here. Firstly, she sees a whip coming at her, and her first instinct is to grab the air below the whip for some reason. What was the idea there? Clearly she could see where the whip was aimed, right? Secondly, when Amethyst pulls out a second whip and clearly telegraphs what she's going to do, Jasper just stands there and does absolutely nothing. Why? There's trying to plant false hope in your opponent and play some kind of weird mind games with them, and then there's making yourself look fucking stupid. One of Homeworld's best fighters, ladies and gentlemen. Is it sinking in yet? Are you serious? If a small little shield was all it took to knock that thing down, it should have fallen a long time ago. And yes, that shield is probably very strong considering it's technically a diamond shield, but then why didn't it break the glass when it struck that injector? It just doesn't make sense. No matter what I do, no matter how hard I work, she came out right and I came out wrong. She's the only one who thinks you should be like her. Stop trying to be like Jasper. You're nothing like Jasper. You're like me because we're both not like anybody. And yeah, it sucks. But at least I've got you and you've got me. So stop leaving me out of this. As worst gems stick together, right? That's why we're the best. This moment right here is what got me to start really liking Amethyst. I'm gonna come off very biased when I put it like this, but I can really relate to her moments of not feeling like she's good enough sometimes when the going starts to get tough. So when this episode first came out, I really resonated with this whole arc. It's incredible just how much Amethyst as a character was changed for the better. It's honestly pretty commendable. However, I think this scene does suffer from some pretty weird pacing. The way this speech is written really feels like there should have been more to it. Like Amethyst should have pushed back a little more rather than just being like, oh, okay, after Steven pleads with her. It makes this come off a little rushed, which I can understand, but it still feels strange. I don't think there's ever been an explosion when two people have fused together. What the fuck was that about? What a Smokey Quartz is such a fantastic character, and her theme is incredible. I wish I could play more of it. Forget your name! You gotta fight to win! Is it just me, or does something seem weird about Peridot's voice in this episode? I can't quite put my finger on it, but it sounds like she has a scratchy throat or something, along with her mic quality not being as good for some reason. In this shot, Smokey's yo-yo is studded with other Smokey Quartzes, but in the next shot, they're back to being Amethysts. One of the gems that falls down from this cliff looks like this, but in the next shot, the yellow section of their head completely vanishes. <sighs> how in the hell did this happen? This goes against most of what we know about how fusion works. I doubt Jasper grabbing this fusion's head counts as any kind of dance. I don't buy that Jasper and the equivalent of a wild animal would be anywhere near the same mental wavelength to be able to just fuse on the spot. And arguing the corrupted gems don't have to consent to fusion not only feels like a cop-out, but it's also disproven immediately by the fact that the corrupted gem is able to unfuse with Jasper by not consenting enough anyway. So this even working in the first place is shaky at best. Also, Jasper is seemingly able to control this fusion pretty well considering that half of it is a rampaging wild animal. You'd think that the fusion would be highly unstable and that Jasper would barely have any control, but nope. Logic is defeated once again by monster look cool and create big drama, so Smokey fight monster. If we go frame by frame in this shot, Jasper's right arm switches colors halfway through. Great job, Smokey. Oh, thank you, thank you, Smokey. Nobody I fuse with ever wants to stay. That's a weird line. Jasper has only tried to fuse with two people, and one of those was a wild animal. Trying to paint her as even remotely sympathetic now is baffling, to say the least. I may be wrong about this, but me and my co-writer's interpretation on corruption was that corrupted gems lose their sense of selves and essentially turn to their primal instincts. With that in mind, how does Jasper keep her memories and sense of self for so long when she starts to get corrupted? Seriously, she has enough time to scream a whole monologue at Steven. You'd think that if corruption targets the mind so much, that would be the first to go rather than her physical form. After Steven's sandals fly off here, they disappear for not only the rest of the episode, but for the rest of the season. This isn't just Shadow Realm, this is advanced Shadow Realm. I see how you do it now, Rose. You want gems after they're worthless. You wait until after they've lost. Because when you're at the bottom, you'll follow anyone that makes you feel like less 
of a failure. It's genuinely really interested to hear Jasper's viewpoint on how Rose operated. And hearing Peridot kind of debate Jasper on this with her unique perspective on how Earth helped her is just the cherry on top. This scene is written really well. I got out because I'm better than this place. It's getting worse. I only came back to finish you off. Try not to move! Wow, Steven looks so concerned with how much he's shaking anxiously. But seriously, this looks weird. I see the animation budget ran out. Jasper's lips disappear a couple times as she's talking in this scene. Look, I know the animation budget could probably only afford the Crooniverse a meal at McDonald's, but couldn't they have at least given them different facial expressions that aren't just mild surprise? I do really like that Peridot is the one to poof Jasper. It's one of those things that you don't expect, but are pleasantly surprised to see happen in my eyes. Nice to see Peridot get a win. I also like this small moment of kinship that Amethyst feels with Jasper here, and also the nod at Steven and Amethyst's familial-like bond. It's a nice way to tie those couple things together. Just look at this one! You've stripped her of everything! I sit by myself Talking to the man. Why exactly are the gems here? How are they told about this? When the rubies arrived at the barn during barn mates, I assume they were just flying around the planet aimlessly considering how they entered. So it would make sense that the gems caught wind of their arrival there. But here, how could they have possibly known the ship was here if it just landed directly at the barn? It's not like Lapis could or would have told them, right? And honestly, if the answer is finally Garnet using future vision, that would make sense. But we'll counter that in a minute. Also, a small correction from last episode. Steven actually did have his sandals on when he came back to the barn and Earthlings. My bad. But then they disappear for the rest of the season from this shot onwards. Yada yada, advanced shadow realm, yada yada. I thought we were done with these guys. You sent them to a planet you knew was not going to have what they want. How could you even begin to think this was over? Why did you come back here? Let's release one and just ask what they're up to. Jesus Christ, do you guys have the memory of a goldfish? They told you why they were here last time. Do you not remember somehow or do you just don't care? And this is even more egregious because this also shoots down Garnet using future vision to see them coming. If she had used it, then she would know why they're here. There's a puddle under Leggy in this shot, but in the next shot it disappears. Let's take a chance on Army. Or you could let one of the more docile ones try first? If I remember correctly, we were on Earth. Uh, ha, this is so embarrassing. Oh, oh, oh. Ah! Gotta keep a prisoner for the diamonds. It's there! I gotta hold this all the way to the moon? Okay, so surely this is the point where you abandon this plan, right? Amethyst not only has to hold this form all the way to the moon, then walk up to the communicator, then she has to talk to and somehow fool the diamonds into thinking she's Jasper, which is a 100% impossible task by itself. But even if that worked, surely the diamonds wouldn't want Jasper or the prisoners to stay on Earth, right? So they'd have to be sent to Homeworld anyway, which would be catastrophic. Why do the gems not just drop this and immediately poof the rubies? They aren't a threat whatsoever, and poofing them would stop them from giving intel back to homeworld if they managed to escape. There's literally no downsides aside from a sad look from Steven. Aw, oh, curses. I can't believe we've been caught. And by none other than Jasper. So cross over it. I'll never talk. <sighs> I wish. Yeah. <laughs> she talks a lot. Is it just me, or does the Earth look weird here? Because of the way the clouds are drawn, all of the ocean looks more like ice than water. Pearl has her eyes closed here, and then when Amethyst starts to approach, without even a hint of fear on her face... <laughs> in this shot, the Earth and the Moon base are positioned like this, with the entrance to the base facing away from the Earth. But in the next shot, the Earth somehow moves in front of the entrance. The angle isn't even different. That is Pink Diamond. Wow, strange how the moment Pink Diamond's name leaves someone's lips for the first time, that's when we get this info that could have easily been told before. I don't know, I just think it's a bit stilted to not even acknowledge Pink Diamond's existence verbally even once before this. Like, not even a passing mention. It's like she didn't even exist before now. 
Maybe it's best if you explain. What, me? I'm getting very concerned with how little the gems tell Amethyst. Especially about something as important as pink diamond shattering. I guess she was pretty much a child when she first joined, but at this point you'd think they would have filled her in on this fairly important shit. Steven's hand has six fingers in this shot. Birth was Pink Diamond's calling. Cue a solid minute of grade A exposition dumping. Christ, the pacing of Pink Diamond's introduction is a mess. First, they don't show us a single shred of information on her outside of background details you probably wouldn't notice. Then suddenly, we're unloaded with a truck full of shit that's frankly a bit overwhelming. Why couldn't they have slowly fed us all this over time and let Steven, and by extension the audience, piece things together until we came to this ultimate conclusion? I feel like that would have been a lot bigger of an impact than this dull thud of an info drop does. The stars on Amethyst's knees aren't on her in this shot. Do me a favor and go back home and file the report for me. Why exactly couldn't you have just said that from the start and saved this whole trip? Or again, even better, why not just fucking poof them so they can't report anything at all? What, did Amethyst not think to get a ride back to Earth? How do you not think of that? Also, why not wait to ship back to your normal form until after the rubies have left completely? You're taking an unnecessary risk by doing this. At least go upstairs out of sight. Also, also, Amethyst stars aren't on her knees here either. Also, 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 both Steven and Amethyst look squished in this shot. Hey, you need a ride back to Earth? I can sit on your lap if you want. Uh, what? I'm so Jasper! <laughs> Yeah, don't stop them from fusing or anything. Take it outside! How is this a good idea? Why didn't Steven wait and see how the fight was going before doing this? For all he knew, they could have been poofed in one shot and then the problem would be solved. This is not only completely brain dead, but this also means the next episode didn't even have to happen at all. It was completely avoidable. But I guess the Crooniverse needed more artificial drama. As if learning your mom was potentially a murderer wasn't drama enough. Also, the fact that Steven wasn't immediately pulled out here is utter bullshit. Also, also, Leggy's gemstone is missing from the fusion in this shot. When Sardonyx forms here, you can barely make out that she's about the size of Yellow Diamond's mural here. But then in the next shot, she shrinks down to about Yellow Diamond's knees for some reason. Don't save Steven or anything! These guys can not only breathe in space, and they know that outer space is lethal for someone like Steven, but they have a whip, they have four different potential fusions they could use, their bodies acclimate to the moon's gravity, so that wouldn't be a problem. This conclusion is so half-assed and forced that it hurts. And the fact that this could have all been avoided by just not following this stupid plan in the first place honestly cements this as one of the most poorly written episodes of this season. Hold this all the way to the moon? Steven's view of space there somehow wasn't tinted pink despite Steven being in his bubble. Also, his perspective made it look like he was spinning wildly, but here it doesn't really look like he's spinning much at all. Maybe it's the perspective, and I just don't know enough to really see why it works, but to me it looks off. Ruby. What the hell is this? Firstly, why were they that close to each other this far out in space? And why did they instantly go in different directions when they were all flying away from the moon in the same direction beforehand? What, did they push each other off in separate directions? Also, why are they not even animated? They look like PNGs. Oh no, the rubies are flying away. How horrible. Hope someone comes and rescues them. There, I just replicated exactly what the Crooniverse did in about 10 minutes. My little YouTube video should not be this competitive with a team of cartoon animators. <laughs> Firstly, Steven was not going that fast earlier. How do you pick up speed in outer space? 
Secondly, there is absolutely no way Eyeball should have stopped Steven's bubble here. That thing is like two and a half times her size. And no, Eyeball is not stronger than a diamond's bubble. Thirdly, since Steven's velocity was halted so abruptly, surely Steven would have been launched forward and slammed against the inside of his bubble, right? Fourthly, why was Eyeball even by herself in the first place? Ignoring the problems with the ruby separating now of all times, what separated her from them first and why only her? Did she do it somehow? And why was she just floating in one place? Why wasn't she moving as much or as fast as the other rubies or even Steven? We're already half a page into the script and we are 15 seconds in. That's gotta be a record. But you... Open the airlock in the moon base. Eyeball's voice should not sound this clear from inside the bubble. When the camera is outside the bubble, Steven's voice sounds properly affected, so why not do the same the other way around? Is it just me, or does the bubble suddenly look bigger in this shot? Despite my gripes with the animation earlier, these backgrounds are genuinely beautiful. If there's anything I can praise about this episode, the atmosphere and the way they drew outer space is really, really good. Come on, I'm right by a satellite. Why is there just a random ass satellite here? At this point, Steven is so far away from Earth that satellites out here would be completely fucking useless. At the very least, I thought Jasper might have some answers. If you wanted to ask her about Rose Quartz so badly, then why didn't you? By all measures, there's no guarantee that you would have gone back to Earth after this. The diamonds might have sent you somewhere else and you would have never seen Jasper again. So then why include this detail now when she could have asked her earlier? And now the bubble looks huge again. Look, I can summon her shield. Who cares about her shield? Her huge sword is what I remember. Hey, I know I wanted to see Rose Quartz and you just summoned her famous shield right before my very eyes. But who cares about her shield? Her sword would prove that you're really her. What? That makes literally no sense. I am in cover, you get somewhere safe. Steven, where is she supposed to go? She's on the outside of a small ass bubble. She could get behind the bubble, but if it rotates a bunch, then that wouldn't be very helpful. I'm unstoppable! You were looking directly at it, come on! How is this in any way not normal? This is how the Kruniverse normally draws these rubies. Also, Eyeball's gemstone loses its facet in this shot. Why the fuck is he doing it this way and not his usual way? This gives off some startling implications about Steven's motives that I really don't feel equipped to tackle. There were rumors back during the war that Rose Quartz could heal her Crystal Gem soldiers, keeping her small army in contention with the superior forces of a homeworld. So was Rose really the only gem in the Rebellion that could heal other gems? Did Homeworld somehow never consider having more than one type of healing gem? And this seems like an especially stupid thing to overlook, considering that after Pink Diamond shattering, they fucking bubbled the Rose Quartzes en masse, effectively taking them out of Homeworld's army. It just doesn't make any sense. An army cannot function without being able to sustain itself. <laughs> I like this shot, establishing just how alone the two of them are and that no one can hear or really know what's about to happen. It's ominous, and it fits this episode really well. Please don't take my gem! Wait, what even happened to me? I get that was for the sake of a joke, but Steven stopping for that is fucking stupid when his life is on the line. They're gonna give me my own pearl! <laughs> oh god. Also, Eyeball's eyebrows just blink out of existence in this shot. Oh man, the Shadow Realm's getting so confident that it takes things even while we're looking at them. You don't have to do this! Use your shield. What will the diamond say when they hear that a ruby defeated Rose Quartz? Push her off of you while she's distracted. We're lost out in space. How are you going to get back to Homeworld alone? Grab the knife out of her hand, kick her, something. You have options, use them. How the fuck is he breathing? He just pushed all of the remaining air out into space. I don't think the bubble supplies him with oxygen because that makes literally zero sense for a gem power to do. And the bubble couldn't have caught any oxygen considering that Steven is still moving and he's quite a ways from the moon base. Steven should not be able to breathe here. This is probably one of the biggest ass pulls so far. Eyeball's knife disappears in this shot. 
I can't really play it because again, Turner will throw all my ad revenue into a furnace, but this music is really beautiful. I love it. I get that it's probably been a couple hours since Steven was pulled into space, but the gems finding Steven in all of outer space is also a pretty big ass pull. It's not like Garnet could have used future vision considering that this is outer space we're talking, and millions of possibilities couldn't even begin to cover it, right? So this seems a little too convenient. However, I really, really like this moment. It's really wholesome and relieving after the stress that this episode might have given people, and the inclusion of Love Like You is a great touch. Holy shit, Steven Sandals made a daring escape from the Shadow Realm to support him in his time of need. How very nice of them to prove me wrong again. Don't worry though, by this shot, I put them back where they belong. How come nobody told me about Pink Diamond? We all did what we had to during the war. Everything's different now. But to completely act like Pink Diamond didn't even exist? Or to not have Peridot or Lapis mention it even once? Especially Peridot when she was still loyal to Homeworld? This feels like putting a band-aid on an amputated leg. It doesn't really help. One of Garnet's gems isn't the right facet in this shot. It should be a square, not a triangle. She didn't always do what was best for her but she always did what was best for us. Despite the pacing on the reveal being lacking, this scene is really well handled. I think having this moment come after Bismuth, an episode that had Steven start questioning Rose a little bit, is pretty genius. And that combined with Steven learning all this really took the show to the next level. I have my gripes, but I generally like this episode as a finale to season three. It really sets the scene for how the show will be going forward. And I think it's an exciting way to keep things going. Really great stuff. And I hope that upon watching them for this series, Series, future episodes will continue to have writing of this caliber. Well, that ends another season. It had its ups and downs, but season three is my favorite season of the show for a reason, especially towards the end. Thanks to all of you who stuck around the channel long enough to see the series continue. And after a small break, I hope to keep pushing until we finally finish this. But for now, I'll catch you guys in the next season. I hope you enjoyed.
and there we have it. Also, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. for me. <laughs> yeah, it's almost 8 p.m. for me. Yeah, uh, my volume changed a few times because I had to turn things up and down. That's what you were seeing. I'm doing this in a video player. so Yeah, because you're weird. 178 viewers, how do I feel? Pretty good! I think, enough. I think the Season 1A remake had slightly more, but I'm very happy with this. Anyway, I'm making the everything wrong with bu public? Public. Uh, public. If, public. Uh, if you want to now watch it without any extra dumb bullshit. So... What? Dumb bullshit? There you go. It's public now. Dumb bullshit? Yeah. You're yeah. dumb bullshit. Yeah, what happened is I saw the word bubbled while I was saying public, so I almost said, I made the everything wrong with bubbled if you want to see it. <laughs> but anyways... I'm so glad that I hopped in, like, halfway to pretty much help with co-writing and shit. Mm-hmm. I'm very certain that for episodes like... Oh, what was one of them I was pretty much clueless on? Probably Beta? Because originally I had a really dumb point for Beta that you snapped me out of. So, yeah. yeah. I would have not been able to write much, and these videos would be two minutes long. <laughs> John, you're really cool. Thank you. You should move Steve for the background. He isn't in space. I can't do that because this background is a video. <laughs> I mean, you could just make a new video. <laughs> Actually, I probably could. I just need to... I was uh... joking. I was joking. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I made that video and just have it looping. I think it looks pretty cool. Yeah, because you're a weirdo. Oh, well. Uh, my by the way guys my teeth stopped hurting yay cool. are you still doing ss 1014 reacts videos no <laughs> damn They're too you much should've. of a pain in the ass to do i like them i like reaction videos so first of all i should also answer a question that i saw um that song that was in the outro was uh, it's kind of hard to pronounce ungravitify from Sonic mm. Riders Zero Gravity. Check it out. Mm. It's my favorite Sonic vocal song. Okay. And yeah, if I ever react to stuff, it's on stream. Because you're a boring motherfucker. Mm -hmm. Plus, ever since my channel's grown as much as it has, I'd feel weird reacting to everything wrong with and kind of punching down. Unless it's Cinema Sins, which I don't really have an interest in regular Cinema Sins anymore. I so. watch him time to time, but yeah. He has played Undertale. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I played it for 70 hours plus. Oh, uh, that's not as much as me. <laughs> uh, will you be taking uh, a break before season four? Yes, I will be. Yeah, because um, he's a dumb bitch. I do plan to do a one-off because I don't know if you know this. Um, July 2nd is when I made, is when I uploaded my first Everything Wrong With, and it ju and July 2nd this year just so happens to line up on a Sunday, so I want to do a one-off for that, but other than that, I'm probably going to be breaking for at least a month and a half, maybe two months, and hopefully and, it won't And do nothing productive. Oh, I, I will be trying, Noah. I want to try new kinds of videos. You know that Save the Light video I made that blew the fuck up? Yeah, something like that. But with something else. I mean productive in real life, but yeah. I could be productive in real life. Yeah. So yeah. I will be trying. I have some ideas. I will hopefully be trying some new things before I jump back into everything wrong. <sighs> I will yeah, warn you, yeah. though, if I'm doing a challenge run, it's probably not going to be Steven Universe related. What? What do you mean, this with the racism? I've never seen that, so... Hmm. If that's a thing, it's not common. Visit Lucid for more social link events, or go to the gym to build your HP. 
More like lower my fucking belly stat. And no, not like in hunger. Like the stat of how big stairs. my belly is. Yeah. Alright. See ya, Morgan. I appreciate your enthusiasm. It was very. Yeah, uh, yeah he flattered. seriously appreciated it. He's she... like, oh, I'm so flattered. Yeah, he I appreciate just... it. Yeah, you were just like, oh, I'm so flattered. I'm so glad someone's so excited. <laughs> or we can go to Mementos today. I don't think we're going to Mementos today. It's 8 p.m. You don't go to the Metaverse at nighttime. If you're confused, you should watch my Persona streams, wink, wink. Uh <laughs> but you get spoiled, so just play it instead. Or you just play it, yeah. Play it. Mm -hmm. Play Persona 5 Royal if you haven't yet. It's my favorite game of all time for a reason. He just lost 100 views. Do you think I care, Knight? I don't care. I'm happy They're that not I'm here getting more than my usual. <laughs> Dude, there are 91 people that are here just for me. I don't care. This is fine. Because you're just so sexy. Oh my god. I will use this, though, since I have 90 people here to say, hey, if you like my personality and stream. Subscribe! <laughs> no. You should, uh. You should you come don't to some subscribe. more. My, you should come to some more of my streams, because. You know, I think they're pretty funny. And maybe I will be making some highlight videos out of them. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And subscribe. Will SODX shorts return? Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm not a fan of Persona. Then well, don't. get out of here. <laughs> Leave. We don't no. want you here. No. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. All kinds of stuff. Oh shit. We should probably pay more attention to YouTube chat oh, streams and play more everybody I can don't. play games. I should. I really I like so. I really like Jackbox and stuff like that. And Smash and Mario Kart, that kind of thing. You should. The problem though is that if I make a stream where everyone can play something and then I get obsessed with it and don't want to stop streaming it, aka SRB2. Sonic Robo Blast 2. If I make one stream of us playing that game, I end up making like five in a row. <laughs> so. I'm sleepy. And go to sleep live on stream. What it's a great only entertainer eight. you'll be. Oh my god. I mean, some people actually do do that, but they're like, oh, pay money that wake me up. SRB2 is fun. It is. It's just, I think people get bored watching the same thing over and over again. But then again, most people watch my videos, so I mean. Stream idea of playing free shitty Steam games with low ratings. That does seem fun. Jackbox games in the Discord VCs. Perhaps. Think about it. Do you play Fire Emblem? No, not really. The Goat Man 2. I wonder if that would work if I tried it now. Imagine if it was a Windows problem. Or a my stupid old computer problem. That would be something. Because the more I use this computer, the more I realize that my other older computer just had a lot wrong with it. Yeah, you would die if you used my shitty laptops. Do you have a Discord? I have a um, a server that my boyfriend over here runs that I am in hey. and use an account only for it. I don't really use Discord publicly much past that. And yeah, the server is owned by me, so and you have to become a member to get in. Yeah, so, so many different... Uh, Obstacle, well not obstacles, security checks. Mainly yeah, pretty because much. I want to keep things as safe as possible. Pay to win. <laughs> well, I mean, it's my server, but it revolves around his channel, so it's yeah. not really. It doesn't revolve my shit. Like. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even really talk in it much for the longest time, so. Yeah. Yeah, we we ha we wanted to go about it carefully, pretty much. We had a system. Yep. I was trying was to a... slowly wean myself back into YouTube instead of diving headfirst in, you know. Mhm. Mm and yes, you can sleep, right? 
Yes, nothing else of substance is gonna happen today. <laughs> After three years, we finished season three. And yes, Sonny, you can go get food. Christ, I'm we, st why? we start, oops, sorry. I don't know why I'm so tired. It's not that time to be tired. I am, we started this season in September of 2019. <laughs> and I would think that, like even and hit the diamond and uh, Steven floats, I was still working out a few kinks here and there. Cause I was coming back from like a half a year long break. Uh, but you remade season one, so that was a good- And I like... remade season one A, eh? that was a good way to practice and get everything worked out. Yeah. I'd like to think that this really sh shows my growth. Especially because yeah. back at the beginning of it, I was very screamy. I'd like to think that over the hiatus, I became very much more chill. Or too at least chill, in my opinion. <laughs> maybe a little too chill. I grew up, uh, what can I say? You know, you might say I was like 18 years old when this season was starting out, but the difference between 18 and 21 is huge. What about me, John? What about me? You, uh, yeah, definitely. I was like a different person in mm -hmm. 2019. Like, you gotta understand, when you're 18 years old, mentally, you are still a child. It's not like a switch flicks in your head that goes, oh, I'm an adult now. I can make mentally sound decisions that have no consequences whatsoever. Yeah, that was really disappointing to me because I was waiting for that switch and then it never came. <laughs> <laughs> never got in the mail. God damn it. So, yeah. I, uh, three years, I definitely think I've grown up. And but how I have I grown videos... up? You, di you didn't say how I grew up. Hmm. You became more... Uh, I guess I could say you became more chill. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I make more... I swear more. Well, I yeah. didn't swear at all. I, I didn't swear at all back then. <laughs> I had previous social links. <laughs> <laughs> I I never swore. I pretended I didn't know any dirty jokes or anything like that. I didn't realize I was transgender. Uh I was fucking depressed. I was very, very much depressed back then. It, I, I was kinda stuck in a hole of depression for years during like my teen years i dropped out of middle school and i was just depressed it's depressed sick in bed mess and now i'm not as depressed i still have mental health issues but i'm speaking to a counselor i'm making progress in my life yay man's really awakened to his persona okay <laughs> Act Persona 4 style, specifically. <laughs> what was your favorite videos? Honestly, Gem Hunt and Bubbled are my two favorites of this season. Gem mm -hmm. Hunt has a lot of good bits, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm doing my best. I was 18 and when I turned 18, teen to teen to teen teen. I thought I would learn to stop doing stupid shit, but the only thing that happened to me was that I realized I don't want to talk or be around people anymore. <laughs> Shame. Yeah. And for me, it was like I thought I would learn to stop doing stupid shit, but I instead realized that the stupid shit I'd done has consequences. <laughs> yeah. Wow, could you imagine doing the wrong thing? And that doing the stupid Get shit was asking. more detrimental to me when I turned 18, so. I think it was, it was just, like, it hurt you, it hurt other people, it was just all around no good. No bueno, so. Shaped yeah. up, and I'd like to thank God better now. And, like, and I forgive you. I forgive what you did to me. Like, we, our relationship in 2019... We didn't know each other. <laughs> no, we didn't. We both had we to didn't, grow up. We, we, were, we were still before we kind of found ourselves, so our relationship was kind of, oh, I love you, hug, hug, uh, like, it just over... Nothing. Over, 
lovey-dovey shit, and that's pretty much it. We didn't know each other at all. And compared to now, where we know each other, we love each other, I'm really appreciated to be here with you. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I came back, you know? It was scary, but I made it work. Mwah. Mwah. And uh, see you, Electric Lime. See ya, and see you more. And, time. yep. What's my favorite YouTube videos I ever made? Ooh, that's a hard one. Considering most of them was everything wrong with. I'm really proud of that Save the Light video. Like, maybe it's just hindsight because it got 700,000 views. But, frankly, I was not expecting for it to get even a fraction of that. And, I don't know. I think I just did something really nice. By the way, I'm DMing you a question. I'll have to look. I'll have to look. See, the light video is very entertaining. Yeah. Please just like one. Here's your answer. One? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. That video has the chance to breach one million views. <laughs> Absolute insanity. The one thing that has gotten even remotely close is something that wasn't even remotely related to Steven Universe. That was back when another meme was popular, and it still is kind of like etched into internet history, and that's surprising. Something little old me did. If there's anything these marathons do, it's put into perspective just like how much I put into this content and how much it has affected other people. It's nice. It's a nice little like confidence booster for when I get down in the dumps and feel kind of worthless, you know? Cause yeah, I you're still not get worthless. The, the thing is, yeah, I know, but I still feel that way sometimes. Where I get and in then those I'll fight ruts. It. I get in those ruts where I feel like I can't really do anything. I'll know? punch you if you do that. That is probably not gonna help. It will totally help. Violence fixes everything. Says I Barnett. should know. Punch. Uh... Punch. Punch. <laughs> I'm okay. I was gonna say it. <laughs> I was gonna make a mistake there, but I didn't. I was gonna say I'm so hot right now, but then I realized what you that are. sounds like. Oh. <laughs> uh... <laughs> okay, my room is hot. My room is hot right now. And so are you. Um, anyway, uh... speak fact, uh, uh, fact, uh, 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 the sky uh, is blue. Well, no, it isn't. It just looks blue. Just the grass eyeballs. is green. Well, isn't color just a brain? Your mom's a hoe. <laughs> she is not. <laughs> um, the fact is, uh, 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 these videos secretly suck. <laughs> just kidding. I don't know. I don't have anything. Oh, that's not secret. Everyone's known that for years. No! I'm just following a trend, aren't I? I need to open up my window right now. Maybe aren't that I helps. just Aren't I just hate watching? If I should don't want, like, what show, I just shouldn't watch it. Why am I even making videos on it, right? That's what the you subreddit know, says. This thing that I've spent seven years on that if I had cared even remotely, if I didn't care even remotely, there's no way I would have even done this in the first place. But the sub, but our sub Steven Universe says you hate Steven Universe. And that's something, isn't it? That's kind of why I, for a time, I posted my videos there. I don't anymore, mainly because I think that it doesn't help as much and it just is depressing. What's the yeah, song's they name? Yeah, because um, look. I'm like, oh wow, this guy really loves the series to the point he's still uploading Steven Universe videos when pretty much the fandoms died to some form of degree outside of memes. Night, so. this is the initial setup theme for the Nintendo 3DS. There you go. Like when you first set up the system. I'm a little sleepy still, John. Crazy. It's almost like you should go to sleep. It's 8 o'clock. Fuck you. Do you know where your kids are? 
I don't have any. We don't have any. You said you don't want kids. <laughs> I know what I said. Uh, what are we gonna have? Kids, John. What are we gonna adopt, Mini John? John Junior Junior. Hmm. It's eight o'clock. Fuck you. Uh. Ah, yeah. Well, this has been fun. I'm probably probably gonna stay on for about another ten-ish minutes, but we'll see. Um, if copyright. Um, permits, I will keep this public. Or it will be... I, actually, I should turn off that setting that automatically makes the stream unlisted. Let's do that. Let's and then not. I will keep it public. I will put it and the other marathon in a playlist. Since the other one is still up to and I never realized it. Yeah, seriously. When are we gonna... When are we gonna dub John Squared? I don't know. We will have a I, giant dog. Crazy. What is it, high pitch, John? I was curious when you said that at the beginning. Is it like, hey, it's me. High pitch, John. <laughs> Am I high pitch, John? No. <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, my voice is higher. Is it the so. spine thing where I was like, hey, I'm going to bend really awkwardly real quick. Hey, it's, it's me, me, Goku. <laughs> Oh, Tomodachi stream. Ah. Okay. Oh, I get it. Hey! <laughs> yeah. Like, John, your fans want someone, let, 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 let's say, in like 20 years, some for some reason you've dropped dead. Who's going to carry on this channel? I guess no one. <laughs> Not even me? Unless I give you the keys. I technically could make you a co owner of the channel. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't fucking do anything with it. Yeah, except write a post that says, yo, man died, L. <laughs> I'd be depresso, so you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Hopefully I at least finish this series by then. Stop making me donate money. OMG, stop. OMG. Stop. Oh my god. Stop. Oh, you're making me donate so much. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Like, like, ugh. <laughs> like, oh my god, I can't even. <laughs> it's just like, ugh. It, like, you know? I feel straight when people talk like, like that. They, they say, yes, queen, and I'm not like, yes, slay! Han failed his death save. <laughs> like, oh my god, slay! Hey, Mecky. Slay, queen, slay! Oh, like, oh my god. Oh my god, uh, why would you do that night? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, doing that. God, yeah. Oh, Renegade. Oh shit, hi! <laughs> What's up? It's been a while. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll be quiet. <laughs> Renegade, this is supersonic from the future. Quick, you need to go back about 30 minutes and watch the video. It's urgent. It has important news about the state of the planet. And and try to avoid this bit so you don't hear me sound like a complete buffoon. <laughs> also, Knight, what do you mean by prank ship? You keep saying it, but I don't know what the fuck that is. Is the girl... <laughs> Is the Greg X Pearl ship confirmed? Oh, is that? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, there you go. There you go, Knight. You got your answer. And I answered it like four happening. times in the video he's referencing. I did a YouTube poop on Renegade at one point. Cool. Yeah, I know. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I should be wrapping this up soon. So what do I want to say? 
say penis. Penis. Yeah. I don't know who made it though. <laughs> Some weirdo. Yeah. Yeah. Penis. Penis. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, if you're enjoying this ultra wacky, insane humor, I'm that's sure totally you're not. Funny, uh, tune into more of the streams. They're pretty poggers. We're doing a least... persona on Sunday, which is tomorrow, probably about six o'clock in the evening or so, because of uh, how takeout don't, is going to work. Don't watch the persona streams. I'm not there. I'm <laughs> never there. I'm close to band, so don't ever go to them if you only come for me. Other than that, though, um, John doesn't uh, really watch shows. No, unfortunately, I try other, to make him. Other than that, I'm planning on streaming more now that I'm free from everything wrong with for a couple months. So I will probably use some of the time that I would have put in that towards streaming. So that'd be night. I mean, that would be weird night. Yeah, that would be night weird. <laughs> that would be night weird. Nighttime weird. Mess. Yeah. So yeah, I have uh, some ideas of what I'm going to do, so hopefully you'll be there for them. Uh, if not, uh, I will hopefully be making other videos that are not everything wrong with, and we'll see if hopefully you tune Would that make them. you... Night, wouldn't that make you friends with benefits? Anyway, um, <laughs> stream earlier, I plan to now that it's closer to summertime. It would be a good way, and especially with um, this guy's work schedule. Uh, it might be beneficial it's a to stream. Joke. It might be beneficial to stream earlier, just so that I can still hang out with him after he's done work. It's a joke based on like not literally friends or benefits, but the fact that you pay him money. Do I need to explain this joke? Because I will explain the joke. <laughs> We're getting closer to future. We are. It's crazy. Anyway, I'm gonna go back like ten minutes. Don't mind me. <laughs> I can't wait to fucking tear future apart with John. Neither can I. That show is a train wreck. It's going to be hilarious. It, but that, that, kind that, of... it absolutely just sucks. And who knows? You know, it's been it's been years since I've fully watched it. Maybe my I opinion will change. I don't think it will, but maybe. Well, the thing is, if yours does, I still have my opinions, which I, I still remember pretty well. So it's not going to change for me. So I'll still tear it apart. Yeah. It's going to be telling you why... For a while, I just kind of stopped. Here like, we are in the summer, and it's too hot. <laughs> Where's the air conditioning? <laughs> I have it right here. If I turn it on, actually, I'll turn it on for two seconds. Here's how loud it is. Oh, it's, you're going to prove me wrong now. <laughs> Give it a minute. Okay. Give it a minute. Give it a minute. Hold on. Oh, there, wait, there John, it is. John, turn it off. Here it is. Here it comes. No. John. Come please. on. John. Come on. John. You'll hear it in a second. <sighs> Anytime. Here we Anytime. are in the future in this world. Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> oh my god. Hey, she is like, a pain oh my actor. god, you're like pissing me off. Bro, if you could just like time. shut up. Any, that would be great. Any other time it comes on, like, I'm next to a fucking fuel tank. I'm not. We'll give it a minute. It's shy. Uh, <laughs> my favorite CB vs. Future episode is when they played Steven Tag again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here. I'm. How long do you guys think it would take to try beat every game in the NSO library? A lot, if you like me, if you're like me and suck at video games. I'm like five three or five four. I don't know which. I'm like five eight or five, yeah, about there. Five yeah. seven, five eight. They call me short, but then John isn't that much taller than me. Yeah. A day for you. There is absolutely... You are severely underestimating how long some of those games are. Some of them are RPGs that by themselves, if you're good at them, take nine hours. <laughs> hey, John. Huh? 
if you're so free this summer, then why don't you come and see me during it? Why don't you just fall? Man, it's hot. Yeah, but we can hang out indoors. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. We don't, we don't have to be outside. I'm not saying my height. Dude. <laughs> the fact that you're probably about, like, taller than me. It's funny. It's funny, considering... Uh, he grew up. Literally, I watched him grow up. Is that wild to think about? I mean, that is weird for us, because we're not really used to seeing that. I am literally an only child. I did not get that opportunity, so it's weird for me. I mean, I'm the youngest in my family, so... I've seen my cousin grow up, so that's the weird shit. Or my best friend, but she's like, uh, well, I think she's like 19 now, which is so weird, mm -hmm. but that's only a two year time. How'd like, you different. guys meet? We didn't meet. He reacted to one of my first everything wrong with videos and I pretty much followed his channel ever since. Air conditioner. What are you doing? Stop can proving you... me wrong. John, can you stop? Just let it go. Never. It will It will come on in a minute, and you will see. You will see what I have to put up with when I'm hot. Gracie, isn't that loud? That's because you mostly hear me through Discord, Knight. You get the filtered version. You get to hear me through a tube. The stream doesn't. My knee hurts. I mean, here? Yeah, just give it a minute. John, can we actually wrap up in Justin? I am, fuck you. <laughs> okay, why do you have to be so rude about it? You can just do that. Yeah. Disgusting. Oh, puberty. Puberty. puberty didn't even hit me that hard. <laughs> I wonder how hard it's going to hit me when I do it for the second time. Mm -hmm. I I'm have acknowledging to do, like, you. Because it's, like, okay. weird that, like, technically I went through puberty once. And then once I go on testosterone, I'm going to have to go through it again. And it's... Uh, I wonder how deep my voice will be. Fucking weird to think about. I'm going to have the deepest voice around. All right. Yeah. All right, all right. I'm going to wrap it up before we spend two hours in reminiscing mode. Um, so yeah. I I can't do it deep without sounding like an obviously fake man boy. Like, I don't, I have not done voice training at all. So. Hello, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mario. <laughs> oh. uh. <laughs> anyway, um. Listen to me. We cannot be doing this. Listen to me. Listen to me. Shadow. <coughs> Shadow, it seems like some rats have gotten loose on the base. Okay. Stay <laughs> away. Yeah. I'm dead inside. <laughs> John. John. Hello. Done. What? Oh my god. Stop it! Now! Stupid bitch! Call! <laughs> okay, that's actually gonna make me cute. Let's stop. Uh, follow the arrow! <laughs> hey, hey! You're going the wrong way! Follow the arrow! <laughs> alright, 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 alright! Anyway. Anyway. Um, anyway. I am fucking hot in my room. You are fucking hot. Can you stop? Uh, if you want to see think? more of me during the Everything Wrong with Hiatus, lots of streams coming your way in the near future. Look forward to them. Uh, I will also be trying to work on a bigger challenge video. We will see how that goes. Um, if not, next Everything Wrong with I'm going to be doing is on July 2nd, hopefully. <gasps> to coincide with the anniversary of everything wrong with then after that maybe another month break and then we will be back to business as usual so yeah 
that's the plan going forward. So when you follow this arrow, you mean go to your channel? Yeah, go to the channel if you want to see more. Watch that no. save the light video. That's not what I meant, but I'm talking about. It. <laughs> All right, I should head off before this takes 15 years. Uh, super lucid. This has been super lucid. 1014. No, oh, why would it be your birthday? Wouldn't it be half my birthday? 214. 0214. 0214. Mm hmm. Say it properly in one whole thing. This is super lucid 0214. Yeah! I like 1014, though. It rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed <laughs> this marathon. I will be keeping it public and put it in a playlist. And I will catch you guys wherever you watch us next. See you guys. I'm going to make John play Uno probably. Probably. Ooh, <laughs> crazy eights on the server? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. Mm. No, right. you're mine. Okay. I'll catch you guys wherever. Will I'm kidnapping John. Me? Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I'll catch you guys somewhere, wherever. I'll see you guys somewhere. Bye bye. Somewhere out there. What's Okay, see ya. <laughs> <laughs>